everyone on behalf of lieutenant general sudhir sharma pvsm avsm ysm vsm our chairman and colleagues at midcat advisory as well as our partners national forensic sciences university and nfsu global association for corporate services jindal school of international affairs op jindal global university security and risk solutions private limited and black pearl extend to you a very warm welcome to mars midcat apac risk symposium 2022 I'm Tanya Singh. I'm a geopolitical analyst at Midcat Advisory. I will be your master of ceremonies today and ensure that every event that is planned for the day runs smoothly and on time. Please give me a moment while I share my screen. I hope my screen is uh, visible and clear. Yes. Thank you. Let me begin by saying that 2021 has been a mixed year for the APAC region with pandemic induced setbacks to some businesses yet it has also provided opportunities for new businesses models the prognosis for 2022 looks good but by virtue of its position in the world order the region may face a number of risks of various dimensions midcat's uh, APAC risk symposium provides a platform to discuss these risks and opportunities as well as hear from industry leaders about the risk to business operations in the coming year I would like to thank everyone for taking out time from your busy schedule and joining us today. Your participation is highly appreciated. For those who may drop off the call in between or were not able to join us for some reason, we have uh, we will have a recording of this event on our YouTube channel shortly, and also a summary report of the event consisting of major highlights and key takeaways that will be discussed today will also be published on our website as well as on our LinkedIn page. We will now move forward with the agenda that we have planned for the day. we will start with the opening remarks on 2022 a year of reset and geopolitical turns in asia by lieutenant general sudhir sharma thereafter we will have the keynote address by sita sen gupta we will then move on to our first panel discussion on geopolitical and travel risk 2022 which will be moderated by colonel samrendra mohan kumar from midcat after that we will have the unveiling of asia risk review 2022 that has been put together by the team at midcat Then after we will go through a demonstration of Midcat's artificial intelligence enabled portal and risk intelligence platform. Our uh, second panel uh, discussion will be on socio-economic, environmental, and supply chain risk, which will be moderated by Colonel Sushil Pradhan from Midcat. After that, we will have a keynote address on a safe portal and the next geopolitical and socio-economic fault line by Dr. Parag Agarwal. We will have a third panel discussion on technology risk outlook 2022, which will be moderated by uh, Pavan Desai from Midcat. and in the summary we will have the closing remarks uh, by mitesha from midcat again without further ado we will now move forward with our uh, first panel event uh, which is the opening remarks by uh, lieutenant general sudhir sharma uh, lieutenant general sudhir sharma has handled distinguished leadership staff instruction and diplomatic assignments including command of the largest operational force in the world he has led and modernized the logistics of the indian army and was india's defense attache in london He has been on the board panel of advisors, governors of large Indian and global corporations. Uh, global corporations. Lieutenant General Sharma is an acknowledged thought leader and expert on defence, homeland, and corporate security. He advises corporations, defence, diplomatic, and home uh, homeland security think tanks, and is a speaker and author of repute. He has been providing his valuable insights on the most salient economic and political risk factors hovering over the globe in major international forums like Doha's annual meeting, Switzerland and Ireland, Global Arab Summit, Secure Tech, and many more. Lieutenant General Sharma has been decorated for gallantry as well as distinguished ser uh, service. He has been felicitated on two occasions by the President of India for leadership and devotion to duty and country. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I would say that it is a privilege for Midcat Global to be hosting this uh, symposium. I hope we have a very stimulating and productive day today as we go forward with it. Uh, friends, as we enter 2022, the hopes of an early reset and return to normalcy has met the headwinds of a new COVID strain, and therefore some shutdowns and travel restrictions have come into place. I, but I see that as some light at the end of the tunnel, and I hope that this will be a small bump and we shall go forward with more resolve as we move forward elsewhere i see that in the absence of a credible and inspiring leadership at the global level the global order today is more fractured than ever before i've seen for a very long time to come i given the circumstances i don't see a return early return to international order which is rule based and therefore 
certain amount of ambiguity, uncertainty, and impermanence are going to be the order of the day, and we'll have to live with it. A new COVID wave has the potential to derail the Asian economy, which are just about rebounding at the moment. But last year, at the last quarter, we were looking at talking about COVID zero. I think, which was a clarion call. I think we have moved on from there. And I think next year, or this year at least, we shall be looking at coping with COVID, dealing with COVID and living with COVID. And I think the transition from pandemic to endemic is started. And in 2022, I predict that we shall get away with the restrictions and take COVID in a stride. And world over, COVID will be managed in a different way than the scale that's been done at the moment. I don't know about China. We are still on COVID zero, but I hope the rest of the world will be moving towards this at the end of this stage. <clears throat> now, the APAC region is very vast and is prone to a large number of risks. So I'll just give a few of them. My first thought is that the ability to demonstrate economic resilience by the Asia-Pacific countries is going to be a big challenge, given the supply chain disruption which is taking place because of decoupling of the economies and of the traditional globalization process are no longer in place. This affects uh, Asia Pacific much more because we do a lot of production in this region. And when supply chain gets disrupted, the producing economies suffer the most. And we shall have to cope with it till a new architecture of the separate supply chain builds up and becomes more robust. Till then, we shall continue to suffer from this disruption as you go on. My next, my next concern is about the extreme climate change and environmental concerns which are taking place. Now, balancing energy policies, sustainability, to build economic resurgence is going to be a big challenge for decision makers and leaders in the continent. Because having committed ourselves in the Glasgow summit on various policies and all, there's going to be a big dichotomy between economic rebound and meeting with this energy policies. So that's something which I think is going to be a big risk, which is going to continue to do so. My next concern, excuse me, The next concern is the technological disruption which is taking place in the region. And uh, we should be talking about it in the next panel, but a huge amount of disruption is going to take place in technology is that unless all the countries of the region are able to understand the, the, the role of technology is going to take place in the year, we're going to struggle to keep, catch up and keep up. And linked with that is the cyber crime and cyber hacking which is going to take place. I'm surprised to know that 60% of the entire cyber crimes and cyber hacking takes place in the Asian continent, and which is showing an increasing trend. And therefore, that could be because of lack of awareness or lack of understanding it. But very soon, the APEC region must cope with technology. Another thought which comes to mind, and which and Mr. Caesar is also here to talk about it, that we need to build technology which is indigenous to the region because we cannot de depend upon technology being coming from the West. So therefore, technology which come up here and start to build up technologies in the region has got to be more resilient as we go and move forward. Having said that, my feeling is that despite all this, the biggest risk to the region is the geopolitical risk. The increasing rivalry between various parties has created Asia Pacific and Asia region as a flashpoint of the world. It used to be a peaceful region, but it's become the flashpoint of the world. And therefore, the whole area is getting militarized. We agree that geoeconomics and geopolitics have got a very symbiotic relationship. More so in the Asian context where you know, we always felt that economic power was one of the tenets of fundamentals of national power. And therefore, the desire to build economic power, to get arms and then create itself the power was the logical way to go. But now I find that geopolitics has edged geoeconomics out of the way. And unless geopolitics is handled, the geoeconomics is suffering. A simple example is the three drone attacks on the Abu Dhabi uh, airport and air terminal and the price of dollar uh, of crude oil jumped by three dollars in the last uh, week and is now showing an upward trend and uh, I'm told that the dollar may hit, uh, crude may hit hundred dollars a barrel. So that is the impact of geopolitics on the geoeconomy and our, our region which is so dependent upon energy will get affected because of turbulence in some other region and that will continue. And therefore I feel that in the coming years, geopolitics is going to dominate the regions of the geogonomics despite what we do so. so. As far as the region is concerned, we were hoping that uh, with the new regime coming up in USA after the, after the elections, there might be some cooling off of tempers and some accommodation might take place between the two powers, both China and USA. 
but that hope has been belied. I think the, the differences between them are too complex and too deep for them to be papered over. And both sides are showing a more muscular and hardened policies. Uh, Mr. Deng Jia, sorry, Mr. Uh, Chinese president who's going into his second decade of power, Z, and uh, Mr. Biden both are trying to be very muscular and therefore they are taking hard lines. And Asia Pacific has become the area that this has happened. The advent of AUKUS, which is the Australian, UK and US Partnership and Alliance and the Quad are a logical response to the power dynamics that are taking place in this region. Something about the AUKUS, I must tell you that the first time in 50 years, the US has given away its technology and therefore the pivot to Asia, which Mr. Barack Obama talked about, is actually now solidifying in terms of actual transfer technology in terms of nuclear submarines. Now, that is a big paradigm shift that's taking place and the region that is going to be deployed is in the Pacific. I was also bring to attention that if you read the fine print of the AUKUS Alliance, it does not only talk about the uh, submarine technology of, uh, but also talks about transfer technology in the regions of quantum computing, in the regions of AI, and lots of technology transfer taking place in Australia, USA, and UK to build that which shall be used to that. That is a change which is taking place, which I think uh, brings to fore that the Asian century, which you talked about, is going to be impacted because of this. Next, I come to the Quad. Now, India as a nation was one of the most reluctant partners of Quad. It was like a very reluctant bridegroom, and therefore it was not very keen to get deeply involved with because of its sensitivity to China, certainly. It wanted to retain a certain amount of relationship, but did not cross the threshold. The India-China skirmish on the border of Ladakh has pushed India into entering the Quad more energetically. And therefore, in September, the four leaders of Quad met in USA, and I finalized a quad, which is more, I think, more robust and more muscular than it was intended to be. But that creates its own tension and dynamics in the region. And of course, it would annoy China, which has felt that both AUKUS and quad called it irresponsible and said that it will increase militarization in the region, which I think is quite true. Now, South Korea and ASEAN have been considered central to the Asia Indo Pacific by USA. Now, they do not wish to be drawn into it, but willy nilly. I think they'll get sucked into the power dynamics of the region. Uh, recently in Japan, in January itself, we had a, we had a maritime exercise of Quad with the Canada taking part in it, in the, known as the Sea Dragon. And South Korea also took part in the maritime exercises along with the Quad partners in that region. But that shows how things are building up in this region that we're talking about. And uh, going forward, Japan, which is a very important part of the region, has been spending a lot of money on its military budget. And its cooperation with Australia and India is increasing quite dramatically. All these things create a feeling that geopolitics has come to stay in the Indo Pacific in a big way. And that is going to impact a lot of us as we go forward. So, I'll talk just a minute. Sorry, I got a bad throat. Talking about Russia, for the first time, we see that very serious battle lines have been drawn between Russia and USA on the Ukraine area. And the, the European Union has never been more uh, together as I've seen this this time. They've really got together. They are, they are, the cooperation has really increased. Uh, NATO has also been extending itself eastwards. And I think Mr. Putin must have thought that this is the last frontier, this much and no more. And therefore, a lot of tension in that area, whether there will be some war or not, I don't know. But peace certainly is not going to be there for many years to come. Similarly, the Taiwan region also, too much of, you know, uh, problem are taking place in that area. And I find that tension in the both regions are going to continue for some more time to come and do so. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, I don't think we have seen the end of what's going to happen there, but not good for the Indo Pacific region because lots of people are getting encouraged by what's happened in Afghanistan. And I think it brings instability to the region. And that is what's going to happen there. So, in a sense, I like to sum up by saying that as far as Indo Pacific is concerned or the Asia Pacific is concerned, we're going to see a lot of geopolitical turbulence and continued militarization of the region, a lot of problem taking place based on that. But on the economic front, I see a resurgence. I see the Asian economies bouncing back. They have got the resilience and they've got the power. A lot of innovation is taking place, a lot of startups taking place, and they're going to see a lot of light at the end of the tunnel as far as geoeconomics is concerned. And I'm hopeful that we shall rebound, be able to handle the COVID and come out of this uh, doing much better in 2022 with the overhang of political turbulence continue to 
travelers for years for South Africa. Thank you, that's all I want to say. Thank you much. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, this has suitably set the context for today's event and the rest of the panel discussions that we have planned for the day. Uh, with this, we will now move forward. Uh, just a second, I think I have there's some technical glitch. I hope my screen is visible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. With this, we will now move forward uh, with our first keynote address, which will be uh, by Caesar Sain Gupta. He is the founder and CEO of uh, Arbo Works, a stealth mode venture funded fintech split across uh, Singapore and SF Bay Area. Previously, he spent 15 years at Google, where he was the general manager of payments and vice president leading the next billion users NBU initiative. As general manager of payments, he led the development and the business for uh, products like Google Pay and Google Finance and managed all of the Google payments systems. He founded the NBU system and was responsible for Google's product strategy for high user growth countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil and Nigeria. He and his team had a dual charter to help improve Google's existing products for the next billion users and to build new products and initiatives from scratch like Google Station, Internet Sathi and Google Files. Prior to this, Caesar has uh, helped to start and let Chrome OS, which powers Chromebooks. Chromebooks are now the leading device used in schools globally, and Chrome OS is the number two operating system for laptops and desktops. Caesar Sain Gupta has spent the last two decades building consumer and enterprise technology products for the global market. Before joining Google, he held engineering and research positions at Accentuate Incorporated, which is a Singapore startup acquired by IBM, and Hewlett Packard Labs, Palo Alto. He holds 15 patents in operating system design and expert finding systems. Caesar has an uh, MS in computer science with a distinction in research from Stanford University and an MBA from the Wharton School, uh, University of Pennsylvania. We are honored to have you, sir, as a keynote speaker today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, and uh, good morning or good afternoon to all of you who have joined. Uh, give me a second, let me open up the slides. Um, as I'm, as I'm, uh, you know, Lieutenant General Sharma wanted me to talk about the disruptions that technology is bringing about and talk a little bit about the implications that those technologies are going to have on all sorts of businesses. So I'm not going to presume I can tell risk professionals about the risks, but I did want to give you some intuition about how to think about all these new technological developments that are happening on a regular basis. So, you know, you, today, if you read and open the news or read anything, you're gonna hear all these fancy terms, metaverse, artificial intelligence, crypto, all sorts of stuff. How does one make sense of what is gonna happen? What is moving forward? So I wanted to go a little bit deeper behind that and give you the four big fundamental uh, drivers that are driving all these changes. At the very core of what's happening today around the world, in fact, not just in the technology industry, but in every industry, is that software is eating this world. So Mark Andreessen, who actually was the inventor of browsers and is today one of the top venture capitalists in the world, but 10 years back, he wrote this quote, software is eating the world. And this has been something that at that point, everybody laughed at him, but today you can start seeing it happen more and more across different industries. In the past, it was thought software is only gonna be left, in, you know, limited to the technology industry. But today you can see that it's leaping industries and starting to redefine how industries are shaped uh, across the world. The best example of this in many ways is sort of Tesla. This graph is very interesting. Like Tesla, Tesla's valuation today in the market is greater than the valuation of all other automakers combined together. And is that because they just make better cars? No, it's because they have rethought the complete industry by applying software to it in a, in a scale that is, is unprecedented. In many ways, you know, people look at Tesla and think it's a car company, but it's really a software company that has gone into the automobile industry and completely redefined it. So what really is happening behind the scenes? And this is just the start of what we're seeing, and this will happen across every industry. At the core of what this disruption are two really big trends that are happening. These are fundamental, fundamental trends. And once you internalize these changes and what impact these changes will have, you can start making sense of a lot of disruptions across a lot of industries. The first of these trends is the rise of the smartphone. 
and how the smartphone is becoming something that's getting everywhere prevalent and in hands of many. And the second is the rise of cloud computing. So let's get a little bit deeper into this. So today there are about 4.6 billion people on the internet, but that has a very important fact, which is that the vast majority of them are actually all on mobile. And these users are not just mobile first. In many cases, these users are mobile only. So the only way they interact with the world of technology or the computer is by using their phones. And this is much more true in South in Asia than it is true anywhere else. And if you dig deeper into it, what you realize is not only is this their only device of computing, this is their first experience of computing. So their vision of how the world works, their vision of how technology works is all shaped by this device that they're holding in their hands. And this is going to be very different from people who started using a laptop or a desktop as their first computing device. These users, these vast majority of these 4 billion users who are starting to use these phones as their primary devices, not only use this as a, as a communication device or a phone device, it's their entertainment device, but more importantly, this is increasingly becoming the primary business device. This is what work is getting done through. This is what commerce is happening through. And the implications of this on the world of business, on how people think about challenges, risks are profound. This is coupled now on the other side. So if you think about the phone on the user's side, on the side of the businesses, on the server side, there is an equally profound shift happening. You know, in the past, computers used to be these massive mainframes, right? You would hear of IBM selling a mainframe. At some point, you heard the generation of PCs and servers with PC, you know, Oracle, Microsoft. Most companies would run all of their services on a big server farm, but you could walk into that room. It would be somewhere in your office. You could have security guards protecting it. That's where your customer data was stored. That's where all your services were run from. But today, increasingly with the cloud, your services are run from somewhere that you don't know. Um, the data is sitting somewhere you don't know. In fact, but what this does is this change has now given businesses access to the kind of technology and services that were impossible in the past, in the previous generation. In the past, a company that is maybe, let's say, uh, a bank would have had to buy special hardware to be able to do anything close to artificial intelligence or machine learning. Today, an engineer in a bank can open a AWS or a Google Cloud account and get started with machine learning and AI. So the amount of access to new technologies to every company is, is dramatically shifting. But what's even more amazing is that we are right at the start of this. This is a graph that shows how many computers are, how many, what percentage of IT spending is going on the cloud versus spending on servers that are still sitting inside their premises. And as you can see, even in 2021, this is a very small portion. The amount being spent on cloud is a very small portion. So a very clear prediction is that over the next you know, 10, 15 years, you will see a lot more of computing just move into the cloud. And this will obviously have tremendous implications for all kinds of businesses. One of the biggest implications of this is going to be that the employees in a company are now going to be using a lot more different types of software. So you can now see the, how the security vector, you know, uh, Lieutenant General um, Sharma talked about cybersecurity. Earlier, you had to worry about cybersecurity for your email and your, you know, your um, office applications. But today, an average employee, let's look at, for example, in energy. In energy, an, app, an average employee uses about 50 to 60 applications. You have to think about the security surface across all of these. Now, when you get to something like media or retail, Retail are shops everywhere. You can start seeing just the scale of the of the, the surface that you have to deal with on an, on an ongoing basis. So what does this mean for APAC? So even before I talk about technology for APAC, I love showing people this graph. What's amazing about this graph is if you look at that circle, that circle looks like a very small part of the overall map of the world. But there are more people who live inside that circle than people who live outside it. I'm gonna pause for a second just so you can absorb it. More people live inside that circle than live in the entire rest of the, rest of the world. So the center of gravity of humanity, 
the center of gravity of commerce is all in Asia. And, and this has profound implications for all businesses. And most importantly, more internet users are going to come from this region than anywhere else in the world. APAC is going to, in, by 2025, you'll see another 1 billion new users coming online. And these are users who are not just going to be doing the usual consumer, you know, entertainment use cases on their phone. They will be buying stuff on their phone. They will be working with their companies on the phone. They will be going to, they will be learning or, you know, educating themselves on the phone, growing with the phone. And so the dimensions of this are, are tremendous. If you dig even deeper into this, you quickly see that um, the biggest scale of this actually is coming from a few countries in Asia. India, of course, is by far the biggest in terms of not just the number of users who are coming online, but also the new users who are going to come online. Now you include India, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all countries in a fairly small region of the world, and you have more people coming online from mobile phones than anywhere else. So what does this exactly mean? Now, the biggest implication of this is think about how people are using computers from this region, these types of people, they're all on the mobile phone. So the usage model is very different from how it was in the US or in UK or in other places. So risk models or software or technology that was developed for a user base that is primarily on computers, on laptops or desktops, is going to be very different when your users can be anywhere. Your employees can be anywhere. Your data can be anywhere. And so we have to think about how this different usage model and build for this new, new era of usage models where your users could be anywhere, your employees could be anywhere, and your data could be literally sitting anywhere. This new change in both mobile and cloud is giving rise to new kind of business models. This means the risk to your revenue can come from many different dimensions, and you have to think about it. The types of business models that are emerging in Asia, in, you know, primarily in the technology world, there was a paper use model or a subscription model. Today, you have many, many more kinds of models. And with crypto, you're getting even more newer kinds of business models that are creating new businesses. You know, India now is uh, second only to the US in the number of unicorns that are getting created. So with each new business in each new industry, you can see a bigger impact in terms of the surface area for the risks, for the challenges that are going to get created. But this is also creating new opportunities. And I think that is where I wanted to focus and end with, which is the opportunity for creating new solutions and for creating new kinds of um, business models in, in Asia that start with Asia, uh, but will have global implications is profound. And so I'm going to close with my biggest learning from Google. I spent uh, seven years of my Google career in California and then the next seven years working for Asia. And my biggest learning was when you build for India, you build for the world. Uh, many of you use Google Maps today. Uh, Google Maps works offline, but we initially launched, we built Google Maps offline for India first. As soon as we built it, people all around the world wanted it. YouTube offline, we built for India first, and now it works globally. And the most profound example of this is Google Pay. We launched it as Tays in India. Many of you who are in India would be using it, if not your family members. Um, and today, and then later, we took the same product, took it to Singapore, took it to the US, and now it's going global. So in many ways, I'd like to close with saying, if you really, really think about it, the opportunity of building for India, building for Asia, is setting all of you up in an incredible way, where once you win this space, once you understand the space, you'll be ready when the world is ready for it. With that, thank you so much. I'll hand it back to you, Tanya. Thank you so much, sir, for your insightful thoughts. We will now move forward uh, with our first panel discussion. Yes. So our first panel discussion is on geopolitical and travel risks across Asia Pacific 2022, which will be moderated by Colonel Samrender Mohan Kumar. Uh, Colonel Samrender Mohan Kumar, uh, popularly known as Sam Kumar, is the co-founder and the managing director at Mitcat. He has been instrumental in building Mitcat into a formidable brand, an alumni of King's College London, Military Staff College UK, and I am De uh, Calcutta. He was uh, awarded the Sword of Honor and President's Gold Medal at Military Academy. He commanded a combat unit and was decorated for the distinguished service. 
one of India's foremost thought leaders. He has led high profile risk consulting assignments globally. He advises and mentors startups and is a director on the board of several companies. Thank you for joining us, sir. Before starting the panel discussion, I was request uh, all the participants to please post all the questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box so that uh, all of your questions are answered by all the panelists. Uh, thank you, sir. Over to you. Oh, thank you, Tanya, for the kind introduction. And wow, what a fascinating session by Caesar. Always a tough act to follow. So good morning, friends in India, EME, uh, EM, Europe, Middle East, uh, and Africa, and UK. Very early morning in UK. Lloyd, thank you for joining us. Very early morning. Uh, good afternoon to friends across APAC, and, and, and good morning, and, and good evening to friends in Americas. And, and Bruce, thank you for joining us past midnight. So happy new year, and thank you for blessing March 22, 2022, with your gracious presence in such large numbers. Oh, I have a power pack panel to discuss geopolitical and travel risks. Outlook 2022, which Jen Sharma has already flagged as the top risk for Asia Pacific. Oh, let me introduce the esteemed panelists, not in any particular order. Oh, we start with Bruce McIndo, oh, MS in computer science from Johns Hopkins, adjunct professor at University of Maryland, founder World Aware and president McIndo Risk Advisory. Oh, Bruce McIndo is a recognized tech entrepreneur, oh, his author, speaker in risk management and intelligence. He developed the TRM3 maturity model adopted by GBTA. Uh, he was recognized by Business Travel Network as one of the top 25 most influential executives in travel industry. Uh, Bruce has served with uh, NSA, CIA, Department of Defense, and NASA, and also been a lead architect on Intel programs for the US government. Uh, deep gratitude, Bruce, for joining us. Uh, I know it's well past midnight. And thank you, Lloyd Figgins, for joining us uh, early in the morning from UK once again. Uh, it's probably 5.35 there. Uh, so Lloyd Figgins is the CEO of TRIP, Travel Risk and Incident Prevention Group, and, and a risk and security expert specializing in overseas environments. So he's quite used to these time zones. A former police officer, highly experienced international security advisor, has worked in over 80 countries, including some of the world's most interesting and hostile regions, what they call remote regions. Okay. So Lloyd is the author of Travel Survival Guide. He's a regular on BBC, ITV, Channel 5, Sky News. Sorry, Lloyd, we can't offer you as big a platform, you know, but <laughs> uh, yeah, but we'll do our best. And then, so we still have about close to 300 people logging in and, and contributes to print publications on security, uh, travel safety and security. Next, we have uh, Prashant Naik joining us from Singapore. Uh, Prashant is the regional face. Uh, Prashant Naik uh, has got a, a number of decorations Certified Fraud Examiner, BCCA, CCTP, uh, CFE, Six Sigma Green Belt, Certified Ethical Hacker, Terrorism Analyst, uh, Read Interviewer. I could go on and on, uh, and I don't, I can't even kind of, don't know the full forms of all of his, got about a dozen of them. So Prashant has been working in corporate security domain for 27 years, uh, managing areas of physical security, information risks, crisis, business continuity, and investigations. So, He's been the co-chair of Overseas Security Advisory Council, the U.S. Trade Department PPP initiative, uh, and he was co-chaired in Mumbai from 2007 to 13, and is currently serving as the co-chair in Singapore. He's been the president of uh, uh, APATAP, APA, TAP, and was on the steering committee of Asia Crisis and Security Group, ACSG, for nine years. He's been working with the Walt Disney Company as a vice president for 13 years, managing uh, global security for the regions of Asia, Pacific, and Middle East. He's also worked in leadership positions with HSBC, a leading global bank, uh, Brinks, and Taj Hotels. Prashant has a master's degree in strategic studies and counterterrorism studies from RSIS Singapore, and a second degree black belt from World Taekwondo Federation, runs marathon and triathlons. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be uh, hoping to get a good regional overview from you. Uh, we have Air Commodore Kedar R. Thakur, uh, MSC MPhil, Alumni of Defense Services Staff College, College of Air Warfare, a distinguished Air Force officer. He's been instructor at Air Force Academy. Uh, he's been Provost Marshal of Indian Air Force, uh, a UN peacekeeper in Democratic Republic of Congo, earlier senior faculty, and now the first dean uh, at the School of Police Science and Security Studies, National Forensic Sciences University. Uh, sir, a very happy 60th birthday and many happy, healthy, blessed years ahead. Thank you for joining us on your 60th birthday. And then when you have another program running, in, in your university. 
uh, and thank you NFSU for supporting uh, March 2022. Samir Saxena, uh, thank you Samir for joining us, is the India Real Estate FM, HSE and travel leader at Marsh and McLean Companies, uh, is alumnus of IHM PUSA, India's top ranked hospitality ins institute. Uh, in his two and a half decades in corporate real estate and facility management industry, he has held leadership positions with a number of organizations, including Mercer and Genpac. He's also the founder of Global Association for Corporate Services, GSES School of Excellence and GSES Foundation. These are all not-for-profit community initiatives. Uh, GSES is nine global chapters, so many in India and thousands of uh, corporate services leaders as members. So we look forward to the corporate real estate FM and workplace perspective from you, Samit. So thank you also to GSES for support to March 2022. Uh, now I can probably uh, come to each of the panelists after the brief introduction. So Bruce, uh, maybe I can come to you first uh, because uh, we have lots happening in the world from US, China and, and the world I would say is in a geopolitical recession. So, uh, and this year, in particularly in 2022, US and China are likely to look inwards and a lot of global challenges will remain unaddressed. And we have a lot of things from Brazilian presidential elections to very interesting things on the periphery of Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan. Uh, we have Turkish <laughs> Lira going downwards. We, we have, you know, things happening in Middle East. At, I, Iran talks slow and, and, and probably progress on nuclear side much faster. The drone attacks happening, Afghanistan, there is internal strife in uh, Ethiopia and uh, um, you know Myanmar. I could go on and on and traditional. Yeah. Risk. <laughs> but I'll, I think I'll leave it to you to probably cover the geopolitical risks, the travel risks, the pandemic, its impact, and and the new travel standard which has come, uh, travel risk management ISO three one zero three zero. So all yours. All right. That's now. A, that's a lot of water to cover, right? Um, I, I'd like to start in framing the top line, which is as I'm working with clients over the last uh, you know, two years during the whole pandemic and a lot of companies reimagining and refocusing and dealing with you know, the world as you just laid out, um, we focus on four things in a particular order. Number one, of course, is people. Uh, the second one, which was mentioned uh, in the opening, which is supply chain, especially in Asia. Climate change, and as we've been discussing here, major power dynamics, right? And the order of that is the order in which we actually have control over the situation. People, great. Major power dynamics, nil, right? So, so that's what we're focused on, right? And uh, so in that context, you know, my primary focus over the last couple of years has been in people risk management. And so focusing on the fact that people and human resources, you know, obviously are in the greatest risk in a pandemic, and then the knock-on effects of not having those people we've seen, you know, uh, play out. So, so people risk management and companies bringing together, you know, not just security, but HR and legal and EHS and travel and everything to, to formulate the asset that they're protecting as the person. And that's what leads to like this new travel risk management standard, right? The ISO 31030, which is a guideline. It's not actually a standard yet, but what that's a rear view mirror guidelines about just focusing on travel. And what we need to do now is take that, those guidelines and retool them for all of our people all the time. We can talk about that later. But on the geopolitical side, um, there's no question right now that the, uh, you know, kind of formulation of, you know, organizations and countries having to choose sides, right? Team China versus Team USA. We're seeing that evolve and it's becoming incredibly difficult to negotiate. You mentioned the quad, you mentioned the reformulation of the alignment in Asia, but it's the same with businesses. And, uh, and we, we see uh, in a long-term forecast, a restructuring of how businesses actually approach the world where we may start seeing businesses fragment into an entity that focuses within the China structure and, and, and others that focus within the European US structure. So that's gonna have implications on how people move around the world, where they move, all of those things. So, 
So that's probably the major dynamic. On the geopolitical side of, of impacts to people, uh, you know, you laid out the waterfront in about one and a half minutes that there's going to be constant disruption, constant uncertainty and challenges in navigating the globe uh, in 2022 in the, in the backdrop of the whole COVID. You know, I, I have great confidence that at least the developed countries are largely going to see COVID whimper away in 2022. Now, a, a new variant could pop up that will disrupt that, but with not only vaccinations that are going global and, and ramping up, but also therapeutics that are keeping people from dying, the, the focus and the concern about uh, COVID will, will dissipate quite rapidly as these uh, medical technologies and pharmaceuticals are, are deployed. So, so that's kind of my you know, big picture and uh, look forward to continuing discussion and drilling wherever you want to drill. Wow, thank you. You covered <laughs> much ground in three minutes and then thank you for taking your time. Uh, Lloyd, can you pick up from where Bruce has left and throw some more light on travel risk management and how, in addition to COVID and overdose of regulations, media disinformation itself has damaged international travel? And probably you could even talk a little bit about impact of sustainability on travel risk management and, and why it makes, good, it makes sense for individual users to kind of pay attention to cybersecurity and why it is everybody's responsibility. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, Sam, and 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 welcome everybody from a very dark and and cold United Kingdom this morning. Um, I, I would just echo what Bruce has said. Actually, I, I think that you know he's hit the nail on the head there with with regards to geopolitical situation in the world. Um, and it is worth noting that um, there's more conflict going on around the world now than at any time since the Second World War. So this isn't just a flash in the pan. This is something that there, there's a pattern to this. And as Bruce rightly points out, this is definitely going to impact travel. But what I really want to look at is um, some of the impacts that have been caused external of those conflicts, um, particularly around COVID-19. And, you know, I mean, we're, we're two years really into that, uh, that pandemic. And the, the doctors that I've been speaking to are sort of saying that the pandemic will probably uh, be announced as over sometime uh, in sort of May, June, July time uh, in 2022. Um, but there's been some, some legacy left over from that. And most of all, I think, uh, in the way that it's been reported uh, as a pandemic um, and the impact that that has actually had uh, globally around the, around the world, um, where the media have actually taken it upon themselves to uh, be the voice of expertise on this. And, and yet, I've, I've known you know, people uh, who work within emergency assistance provision um, who have got a really good take on what is happening. I'm talking about medics, I'm talking about security professionals and so on. And very rarely are we seeing those people interviewed in the media. What we tend to be seeing is journalists interviewing other journalists on subject matter that neither of them have any expertise on. Um, and this, of course, then leads them to be able to direct that narrative. And in turn, it leads to disinformation. So just to be clarified about what disinformation looks like, um, you can break it down into, into four Ds. The first one is, is to dismiss, and that would be ignore the evidence um, without looking at the, you know, or ignore without looking at the evidence. The next side of that is distort, where you make up evidence to suit your own agenda. And I think we've seen that not only from the media, but certain governments around the world. Um, distract, switch the focus to something more emotive, and finally dismay. And that's where we come out with these uh, lurid and terrifying hypotheses and headlines about how the world's going to come to an end. And, and, and that's actually really quite important because it's had a very detrimental effect on travel. Um, and this, this has largely gone to um, erode uh, traveler confidence, whether that's business travelers or whether that is uh, people who are traveling for, for leisure. 
Um, so that that's one area that I, I really think that needs needs to be addressed, and we need to start hearing the voices of experts rather than uh, the, than journalists who have turned into experts. Um, and I use that term very loosely uh, on a particular subject matter. The second thing I, I really think we need to focus on is, is as you said, Sam, cybersecurity and making sure that organisations realise that cybersecurity is absolutely everybody's responsibility. Um, that we, we're not only dealing now with, 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 with hackers, we are dealing with state actors. And people don't realize just how valuable some of the information that they have on their, their laptops when they travel or their tablets or their smartphones. And it's, it, it, it's really, really important that organizations inform their travelers as to what those risks are in order that they can mitigate them, because it's not just a financial risk, it's a reputational risk and so on if they are compromised. And then finally, um, sustainability. Uh, and uh, we we have the, the trip group. We've done a lot of research into this. And you know, of the Fortune 500 companies, a lot of them are not uh, allowing their executives, their people, to travel unless it is absolutely essential travel. And they're they're using sustainability as as the reason for this. Um, but there is evidence to suggest that actually it's they've seen the cost savings that they have made throughout the pandemic on not putting executives on aircraft and sending them around the world. So I do think that that's an area um, that, that will uh, impact travel um, quite a lot in the next few years. I think it will be temporary. Um, purely and simply because of the the fact that uh, as human beings we 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 like to interact we're social animals and so I think that it will be short lived but certainly in the short term I think it uh, it definitely needs to be recognised as a risk and I I'd finally like to just echo what Bruce said about ISO three ten thirty. It is a guidance document, and I think that uh, too often we're seeing people trying to use it as a stick. If it's used as a stick, it will have no effect whatsoever. It is only a guidance document. So thank you very much, Lloyd, and, and thank you for reinforcing much of what Bruce has said and, and, and introducing I, my key takeaways are your four Ds, dismiss, distract, distort, dismay, and, and experts, not pseudo experts, or journalists feigning as experts. So that's my takeaway. And second is cybersecurity is disruptive and game changing and there are big actors jumping in. So we better be careful. And a lot of it will be discussed probably in the last panel. So we don't want to kind of, uh, you know, discuss it all here. Okay. So thank you very much. Next, we come to you, Prashant. Uh, you are the regional face from Singapore and you work in a regional or let's say hemispherical role. Uh, in an organization where I would say security processes and practices are much more mature and so are the people. So can you give us a sense of the key geopolitical risks and events across the APAC region, uh, which you are monitoring or likely to monitor in 2022? I mean, from Afghanistan to probably Thailand and Indonesia to Philippines, the, the whole, whole region. And then second is, if I can just kind of uh, add to that, how is COVID actually impacting uh, organizations and businesses in the region and particularly impacting business travel? And what your top concerns are? How do you manage travel risks? And why do you manage it the way you do? So, so, so all yours, you could cover these and many more things all in three minutes. So Prashant, all yours. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Uh, I'll, I'll just like to begin by saying that these are my views and not views of the organization, just to put a disclaimer in place. And uh, of course, it's pretty high pressure to go after Bruce and Lloyd. I'll be probably preaching the choir, but uh, what I can do is, of course, give you a perspective of the private sector. And uh, to begin with, uh, you know, on the geopolitical side, I'm not, not really replicating what Bruce uh, said earlier, but uh, maybe uh, the US-China uh, relationship, that, that's what I'll probably begin with. And uh, in the private sector, of course, we are all looking at the complex nature of how this relationship is unfolding right now, and, and particularly the competition between these countries, uh, you know, uh, how this can be prevented from escalating into possibly potential border conflicts. Uh, the US uh, diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics you know, to regional security dialogues with Japan uh, and India, um, you can see the contention is clearly persisting. Uh, again, uh, the impact uh, US-China relationship has on technology or supply chains, uh, investments, and businesses that operate uh, in both regions at large uh, is pretty evident. Again, moving over to Taiwan, uh, on the other hand, that's also a major flashpoint, uh, particularly with the increasing number of 
uh, air force incursions that we are seeing into the Taiwan's air, air defense zone, and of course uh, the political discourse that we are seeing around it. Um, maybe moving to uh, Afghanistan, uh, the situation in Afghanistan has uh, continued to deteriorate uh, post the Taliban takeover, which we saw in August last year. Uh, again, uh, more broadly, the concerns that we are uh, you know, looking at is the increasing uh, ISK attacks in Kabul, and uh, then particularly what it means for uh, regional security in the long term. Again, the presence of uh, the transnational terrorist groups, uh, that's not new for us here in South Asia, uh, but we are yet to see how these events uh, will impact the movement of foreign fighters, particularly to countries like India. Um, we are also monitoring uh, anti-government protests, which is again a key security concern in the region. And we've seen a rise in the anti-government protests, uh, particularly in Thailand. Uh, so now, uh, although uh, in Thailand, the protests seem to have reduced in frequency, uh, we still feel there's an elevated risk of uh, violent crashes uh, between protesters and the local law enforcement. Now, uh, for, for the private sector, and as we move towards returning to office, I think uh, we, we continue to assess the impact uh, that it's going to have on our employees and, and of course, our offices. Uh, in terms of the protests, we've seen similar protests uh, in countries that have uh, vaccine differentiated measures because of COVID. Uh, and if you re recollect in September last year, uh, we, we saw violent protests erupt in Melbourne, uh, which were related to lockdowns and, of course, the vaccine mandates. So that's also something that, uh, again, impacts our business and uh, our employees and offices. Um, not, not to touch upon a lot on the Korean Peninsula, uh, but that's also something that we are monitoring very closely in the recent times. Uh, in fact, this Monday, uh, North Korea launched two missiles, which is the fourth in a month. So, and then, no, we've seen uh, similar activity last year as well, where there was a similar practice of missile launches uh, in a very short span of time. Uh, we feel it's uh, possibly to extract uh, maximum concessions uh, in any future international negotiations you know, which North Korea might want to do, you know, to kind of just and continue to sustain pressure on uh, regional and global stakeholders, um, particularly uh, in the run-up to the South Korean presidential elections uh, in March. That is something that's on our radar as well. Um, uh, as, as Lloyd mentioned, you know, while the pandemic uh, accelerated digital transformation in the region, it has also brought us a lot of exposure to cyber threats and aggravated concerns. Uh, but particularly uh, concerning uh, misinformation and disinformation. Now to tackle the fake news, you know, particularly around COVID, which also uh, Lloyd briefly mentioned, uh, many countries have now introduced regulations to combat misinformation. So you know, all of these things, of course, raise concerns about this new wave of media censorship. You know? So I'm just preaching the choir here, but this is all on our minds. Uh, just in interest of time, I'll quickly move over to the travel risk, uh, particularly around COVID. Uh, and then just as we were seeing uh, easing of restrictions uh, you know, and opening up of borders in APAC, uh, the Omicron variant came in and now governments across the region are reimposing tighter measures. Uh, Australia, looking at Philippines, and now even India are uh, among those in the region who have kind of seen significant increase in the cases. Uh, if you've seen Australia last week, uh, it crossed half a million cases since the pandemic began. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, 50% of them came in the last two weeks. So, you know, I mean, um, uh, you look at Singapore, it's, it, it saw a halt in the you know, sale of tickets for the Singapore vaccinated travel lane, where we're just beginning to start traveling out of Singapore. And uh, you know, there was a suspension of quarantine free travel, uh, even in Thailand. Uh, you look at Japan, uh, that's also banned uh, entry for nearly all foreigners at this point in time. Uh, the concern that we have as a private sector, and, and Lloyd, I agree with you in terms of cost savings, uh, you know, by, by not having the executives travel. Uh, but there are uh, some other concerns that we see in terms of quarantine, where business travelers have to quarantine for, you know, uh, 14 or 21 days. We're looking at the Beijing Olympics right now. Uh, uh, you know, and, and Bruce, you mentioned about zero COVID approach. Uh, China and Hong Kong uh, you know, have a mandatory quarantine from 14 to 21 days. When we send our um, well into Beijing, that that's uh, you know for 21 days of quarantine. I, I think I'm running over uh, time, but quickly, you know, vaccination is another concern, and uh, of course, if our travelers contract COVID-19, that's another concern in terms of duty of care towards our employees. So I'll, I'll take a pause and probably talk more, and uh, uh, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Prashant, for that comprehensive overview of geopolitical and travel risks in the region. Uh, Next to you, Air Commodore Kedar, sir. 
I want to probe you on two themes because you wear two hats. One is uh, of a security and risk expert. Uh, so as in that role, can you walk us through the key geopolitical risks in the region? And second is the hat of a dean of National Forensic Sciences University. And I personally deeply believe, and I think this is something that you two share, uh, that government industry academia collaboration would be the linchpin for success. So, so we have a lot of industry leaders here uh, on the panel as well as in the audience. So can you let us know what, uh, you, know, what are you doing to provide us industry ready professionals and, and what your expectations are, if any, from us, the, the industry people. So over to you for your uh, uh, three minutes opening remarks, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Colonel Sam, and uh, good morning to you as well as other panelists and all the participants. Uh, thank you, Mitcat, for giving us such an opportunity. It has always been a pleasure being with you, being with Mitcat, and uh, we have had a wonderful association uh, for last three years in uh, enhancing the industry uh, academia collaboration. Uh, for the benefit of viewers, uh, about two years back, before COVID hit us all, we had hosted a wonderful event at our university, uh, wherein uh, 30 senior CSOs and uh, CISOs from different uh, sectors of industry had uh, visited, had interacted with us, had given their uh, view, and uh, it, it made a, a great beginning. And I'm sure once COVID is away, uh, we would uh, restart from where we left last. Uh, so we, I fully agree with you, uh, coming to your second point, that yes, government, industry, and academia necessarily have to join hands, and that is the, the way forward, and uh, we are all out uh, to be there with you in whatever way we could do it. Uh, as far as the academia is concerned, uh, we are uh, at all times uh, wanting to be contemporary as to what is happening and uh, prepare our students accordingly because finally they have to join the industry. So unless and until we prepare them for what is required, what industry expects, uh, no point in giving just academic uh, knowledge, we firmly believe in that. And that's the reason, uh, as you would like to know, recently we have nominated Colonel Sam and Colonel Chandravat. I think he's also around uh, in our board of studies to guide us in not just uh, formulating the syllabus, but also in uh, planning how to train our students so that they are business ready, they are job ready once they passes out. So we are, uh, uh, we are at it and we would continue to be on it and we would request the industry leaders here, please feel free to contact us, to interact, to guide us. And uh, we would uh, take two steps forward uh, in uh, going further into that. Uh, coming to the geopolitical risks, if uh, Prashant felt that uh, Bruce and Lloyd had made his job uh, difficult, he himself has further made my job difficult. But nonetheless, uh, I would uh, uh, touch upon a few of the issues uh, uh, which uh, we are well aware. But before that, most important thing is, I, I feel being from the other side of the industry, that uh, there is a strong requirement for all the industries, whether global, regional, or the local, to have a good awareness as to what is happening around. And that is about what is the geopolitical position, geopolitical situation which is prevailing. I am not too sure as to uh, what is happening on that front, but I feel it is very important to be aware and to, be, uh, to, to know what is happening around. As far as the uh, current geopolitical situation is coming, we are well aware that globally, US as well as China, both are engaged more with their internal issues rather than external issues. In fact, Corona has brought some kind of a pause in uh, whatever aspirations or whatever activities they were doing. And uh, of India and uh, Middle East and Africa continue to be engaged with their own historical challenges. Lebanon is uh, in uh, their own political economic crisis. And essentially COVID has uh, made things difficult for everyone. Vaccine inequity, is threatening to uh, delay the pandemic's transition to endemic. And so as far as the tra uh, travel risks are concerned, the governments all over will have to rethink about the policies. The blanket travel ban, which we saw during the first wave, I don't think that's the solution. India, I think, has taken a uh, step forward wherein lockdowns are not being imposed and the blanket travel bans are not being imposed 
because that is not the way to go about it. Coming to Indo-China relations, yes, uh, we have not progressed much. Although a large number of uh, talks at the military and diplomatic and the uh, different levels are taking place, but uh, there is no progress in uh, bringing relations to normalcy or semblance of normalcy. On our part, India has uh, banned large number of Chinese apps. And yet, uh, very surprisingly, as far as the trade is concerned, that continues to grow between India and China. South China Sea continues to be an uh, area of concern, while China continues to insist on ha having entire control over the nine dash line and uh, continues to expand its uh, navy. Uh, the Quad and the other uh, stakeholders are equally keen not to let China have its way. Indo Vietnam relations have uh, been improving, and uh, literally, India has pulled out a, a surprise by entering into a BrahMos contract with Philippines, which will have its own implications. Let's see how China reacts to that. As far as India-Pakistan is concerned, the cross-border terrorism continues to be the main issue. Kashmir continues to be beset with the attacks now and then, but India is giving back. India is not uh, accepting the way it used to be. Large number of terrorists are getting killed, and uh, we are also accepting the casualties on our part the, whatever the fallout be that. But more importantly, Pakistan needs to be watched. Economically, it is in dire straits. It is on the FATF gray list. I'm wondering why it is still on gray list and not on the black list. But uh, whatever ambitious 100-year peace programs and all they may lay out, but economically, they are in dire straits and that will have its implications for the businesses as well as for our own uh, security. That is how I look at it. Internally. India is uh, coming up with large number of elections in the major states of Punjab and Uttar Pradesh. And uh, uh, like in uh, case of US and other cases, uh, there are divisive and electoral violence taking place. We have just gone through the long former protest, which had its own uh, local travel risks and uh, had a great impact on the social well being of the country. So, to conclude, uh, gentlemen, uh, interesting days are ahead on geopolitics and travel risks. Let's see what other experts have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Air Commodore. Uh, I think you, Bruce, uh, Lloyd and Prashant have comprehensively covered the geopolitical and travel risks uh, and as it impacts the organizations. And thank you for giving the academia perspective. Uh, and, and we completely endorse what you've said. Uh, so Samir, to you, you are the corporate real estate guy here. A uh, couple of years back, we used to have a thing called office. Now, some of these young people, young folks who are in the workplace today, they have never been to an office. And so, so what do you see, you know, are the trends in corporate real estate? What's happening across the Asia Pacific and Japan markets? And then from Japan to India, if you could cover the trends across corporate real estate, I'm, I'm told it's again on a rebound. So all yours, Samir. Thank you. Three Thank minutes. You, Thank you, Bernard Sam. I hope I'm audible, right? Yes. Okay. So, you know, uh, it, it's such an interesting thing when I'm here sitting and witnessing the kind of geopolitical uh, analysis coming in from all the experts. And this greatly reflects on the entire corporate real estate uh, as well. As we, as we, if I quickly go to pre pandemic times, 2019 was the time where we had seen some of the real estate transactions, which are obviously all time high. And today, when we see it, yeah, last couple of years were bad. But then the good news is, on the way, 2021, the first nine months, it rose almost 30% uh, uh, quarter and quarter across the APAC. So uh, if I quickly cover on these sectors, which is like office, market, retail, hotels, leisure, data centers, and some of these uh, sectors which are attracting a lot of growth. So... The grade A office market, the grade A offices across the APAC region, they are, they are seeing a very, very positive pull. And uh, we are expecting 2022, uh, maybe somewhere around 19 to 21% of growth uh, in the demand for the grade A office space. And, and right now, as we see, the uh, vacancies have almost plateaued. The other important part uh, for this sector would be that the technology and ESG will play a very, very important role. And this does not diminish the point where we are looking at greater employee flexibility, health and well-being at the workplace. Uh, retail, 
I think the retail rents are likely to recover. Uh, right now, they, we have started seeing recovery, but then there is a very, very cautious and an optimistic uh, return, if you could say so. The other part in the hotels and luxury or the leisure destinations, we will see a return and this will be this return would be faster than the corporate sector. So we are going to definitely see a lot of positivity around. Interesting thing is that the demand center, the investment and the and the demand uh, for the data center, this is phenomenally growing as far as uh, Australia, Singapore, Japan, Southeast Asia and India market are concerned. All of them, we are seeing a huge demand for the data center. Mm, interestingly, life sciences and the assets which are being primarily driven by them, they are seeing an upward push. Uh, also, the logistic market, that approximately is set to grow by almost like 15 to 20 percent as far as 2022 is concerned. So there, there will be a lot of interesting insights. And, and uh, let me quickly uh, share some of the interesting projections that we are seeing. If I talk of real estate transactions, uh, ex we, we are expecting 2022 would be either pre-pandemic level or a little more than the pre-pandemic level. Again, uh, there is a there is a caveat over here. If at all we do not have another pandemic, so that goes without saying. Uh, in Japan, interestingly, we are we are seeing a lot of demand, but then Japan has had a lot of supply which is which was already there. So that's why the kind of rental push that was supposed to be there, I think that that's very very uh, limited. Leasing activity overall is on the road to recovery. It is limited, but then it's on road to recovery as far as Japan is concerned. Interestingly, all across the APAC region, the pace at which rentals were declining, that is slowing up. That means we are going to go up back again. So the curve is going to work the, uh, or the curve is actually um, to the lowest ever. Uh, so obviously there's poised to recover. The good news for Indian, uh, Indian market is that uh, Q, quarter on quarter for the last uh, three quarters, if I see, uh, Delhi NCR, we have almost witnessed 130% growth. Uh, Mumbai has witnessed 2.5% 2.5 times the growth. Bangalore already has an adoption of uh, almost 1 million square feet. Chennai, 500% quarter and quarter growth. I think these some of these numbers are staggering and phenomenal. And looking at the positivity, I can go on and on, but I'll take a pause over here and hand it back to you, Colonel Sam. Uh, we will touch upon some of the things later, perhaps. So, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samir. And uh, I, I still miss the human interaction. Uh, okay, technology has made our jobs easier. But I, I still miss, you know, meeting colleagues over lunch, the, the cooler side chats and, and, and some of the software. So thank you for that optimistic note. So what we've got about 13 minutes left. Uh, so... What we can do is we can have like a rapid fire. So Bruce, probably I can give you put three questions in two minutes and maybe Lloyd another three questions in two minutes and then we'll see time. And then, then probably a couple of questions to everyone, you know, so everyone gets two minutes. So roughly, uh, Bruce, are you ready? Oh, You're on yeah. mute. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yep. Okay. So first, uh, how might the new ISO standard impact organizations and security teams? 30 seconds. All right. Well, it's not a standard yet. Uh, so we'll worry about that down the road. It is guidelines. Um, I think for larger corporations, it does provide a framework. Um, my only caution is it's focused on travel and organizations need to open the aperture to focus on the asset, which is people, whether they're in travel mode, whether they're remote, whether they're, you know, nomads, whatever. So uh, so they're going to have to embrace it from a risk management, but it's, uh, it is a guideline. I, I, I love countries like Indonesia, Philippines and all, and we would have loved to see, you know, Indonesia is a fascinating country. We would have loved to talk about a little bit about uh, corruption. You know, how do you deal with the government people, the police, the military, <laughs> the, the NGOs, activists, and, you know, I mean, I, I didn't want to pro Prashant too much on that in the limited time. Uh, and, and, you know, problems in West Papua to terrorism probably making a comeback. But when we will go to Philippines, I think, uh, Bruce, that's closer home to, to you. So do you think Philippines sure. in May will create concerns for travelers to the region? Um, well, one, it's, a, you know, like India, the Philippines is a big outsource provider for 
lots of our, our clients, uh, you know, we are concerned about the elections and there will be, you know, large demonstrations, uh, but, you know, at, at balance, we don't see a major impact uh, to travel in the major business centers. So, but, you know, there will be, and they need to pay attention to the election dynamics. And, and, and finally, you have an optimistic outlook for the pandemic and, and you are kind of pushing it to an to endemic by middle of the year, what Lloyd also alluded to. Uh, so what could have append it? So I'm going to just qualify this. It's going to be endemic and less of a challenge for developed countries that have access to vaccines and therapeutics. For the rest of the world, they're going to continue to suffer for, I would say, you know, optimistically end 2023. And that window in the next two years provides ample opportunity for a nasty variant to pop up and to disrupt us again. I hope that we've learned from the last two years that, you know, just because you have a huge hammer doesn't mean you use it all the time. And we, we need to be better about managing this. And I do have grave concern for China as they open up for the Olympics, because there is a lot of dry powder there to catch fire. And, uh, and so we will see how they deal with that. And, you know, they're obviously, you know, trying to maintain a COVID zero environment with aggression. Uh, we'll see. So. Yeah, so, so thank you for probably, I would like to reinforce with some statistics about, so globally sure. about 50% is vaccinated. Africa, it is below 7%. So that reinforces what you said. Uh, some China you've already kind of covered. Uh, so while the developed world is trying to boost its way out of, uh, you know, maybe the pandemic, large swaths of the world and particularly Africa and, 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 and many of the developing countries in Asia, they do not have adequate vaccines. So, so thank you. I think Bruce, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'll sure. come to, yeah, and we're doing well for time. So Lloyd, uh, your three questions very quickly, total two minutes. So what are the um, major threats currently to travel risk management? Uh, travel risk management is uh, it has always been quite specialist. Um, and everybody that, you know, is on this panel today has been involved in travel risk management for a number of years, you know, decades. Um, I think one of the biggest threats that we're going to see now is imposters um, seeing that travel risk management has moved very high up the agenda, particularly for business travel, and we're seeing people entering the market who really don't know what they're talking about. Um, and I see that as a massive risk to travelers um, and to organizations who have people traveling. And, and we've seen examples of it. So, so I'm very concerned about that. Uh, and I do think that um, those established organizations probably need to collaborate with one another rather than be in competition with one another in order to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we're keeping people safe with sound uh, information and advice. <clears throat> So very quickly, I'll combine two questions. One has popped up uh, in, in the Q&A mm -hmm. box from PK Kurian. Uh, and Lloyd, this is again for you. Uh, and again, I'm talking about the British PM and I'm not talking about the party, you know. So, I mean, I, there is, I think, opposition making enough noise. So I'm, I'm talking about the British PM announcing all the restrictions being lifted. Uh, so there are concerns around that. One of the panelists, one of the participants is expressing concerns. Do, do you think the decision is a bit... Hasty and uh, kind of should could they have waited for WHO to formally uh, you know kind of announce its judgment and then second is what is your experience of dealing with the media during the COVID if you can take these two yeah, the British okay um, I think I covered the media uh, in my opening statement actually um, and you know I, 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 well, I, let I, me let, sorry sorry for butting in let me put the last question again to you a different one then how do we kind of restore traveler confidence so a what the British PM is doing right wrong. And, and second is, how do we kind of restore traveler confidence? Okay. Um, the British Prime Minister at the moment is under a huge amount of pressure, not just from the British people, but also from inside his own party. Um, and so we, it, 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 it's, it's quite openly spoken about here that, you know, he's, he's doing certain things in order to detract from his, his own personal uh, issues at the moment. However, what I would say is the advice that the British government took very early in this pandemic um, has been recognised as seriously flawed. And we had, you know, some predictions saying that there would be 5,000 deaths a day, um, which obviously never came to fruition. 
ocean in a, in a country that's got a population of just over 60 million. Um, but they are, it goes back to what Bruce was saying, they're re relying very heavily on vaccination. Um, but it's also very important to note that those who are dying of COVID in the UK, uh, in the vast majority of cases, either have an underlying health condition, um, are not vaccinated, um, and uh, or are very old. The average age of the person or people dying is 80 years old. So when we actually have a look at how that affects the vast majority of the population, they're, they're, they're largely unaffected, particularly if they're, they're vaccinated and they're boosted. So I think that Boris Johnson is, is really going on uh, the facts rather than the predictions. And, um, and uh, I, I think if, if we all waited for the, the World Health Organization on every single matter, Matter, um, then I think the world would come to a grinding halt. Uh, Prashant, to you next. I think uh, two themes I want to take up and, and, and about two minutes, just under two minutes you have. Uh, firstly, in a world with so much information, it is very easy to get defocused and because much of the information is contradictory or misleading and something Lloyd uh, alluded to. Uh, so smart security and risk managers, they try to look beyond the horizon and around the corners and then they try to foresee and mitigate risks and then shape uh, you know, decision making by giving uh, proactive and, and smart business insights. So how do you, how do organizations manage safety, security, business continuity and duty of care related risks uh, smartly these days? Does it a command kind of build a robust or mature intel program? And, and very quickly, second question, I'll put it now only because we have less time. Uh, there are many young professionals here and, and some mid-level and senior professionals who want to graduate to read. So any advice, advice or wisdom, you know, how, how they could get to your place? Well, I'll try to kind of wrap up. Uh, but to, to your question about having a matured intelligence program, I think that that's the key here. Uh, that's the nerve center. Uh, and then the organization, I feel, uh, has to have a mature intelligence program. So we basically have a program that compares uh, our program, the industry peers. Uh, it, it helps us manage our risk thresholds. And particularly for an organization like ours, we have multiple lines of businesses with different kinds of risk thresholds. As an organization, of course, we have a very low risk threshold. But then there are certain sections of our organization which do have risk uh, thresholds. And that's the program that uh, you know, helps us assess our risk thresholds. Um, again, you know, we have a very proactive, uh, you know, uh, nature of function where we focus on horizon scanning, just to make sure that we anticipate the risks to the organization. Uh, you know, uh, we have a very strong network of relationships in the industry, you know, particularly with the peer group, law enforcement, uh, intelligence agencies. So, so that, that's, I think, a very key uh, requirement for a successful intelligence program as well. And again, again, keep keeping stakeholders informed of these growing risks, uh, uh, what we try to strive for uh, is to be a governance function and not just a support function. So uh, being a governance function, it's our responsibility to make sure our stakeholders are uh, informed uh, of, of the growing risks and, and the consequent business implications. So and the, they are able to then you know, focus and, and have a, a strong support for the strategic uh, decision making. So I, I think you know uh, they also kind of you know give a very strong uh, regional nuance and context uh, when they are you know representing uh, you know, this through a very uh, diverse and a local security. So I think that that's on the uh, intelligence program and uh, just the last one that you said. I'm not sure I'm the right person to guide uh, people, but I grew up with this phase. Uh, you know, which everybody told me, uh, "Jack of all trades is master of none," and that's how I grew up. I, I, I disagreed with that term. And as you see uh, how I grew up in my uh, you know, profession, I started, uh, I started uh, in, on a very diverse note where I started uh, learning security, business continuity, information security, Six Sigma, investigation, cybersecurity, you name it, and, and I did it. So I think that's one of the key mantras of my success. Uh, where I would take a pause and revisit that statement, which said, Jack of all trades is master of none. But we were only taught half of that statement. The complete phase is, Jack of all trades is master of none, but oftentimes better than uh, better than a master of one. I, I think that that's the message I would like to give out. Thank you. And, and thank you. And thank you for touching subtly on that network is net worth. So thank, thank you, Prashant. I think you live it. And so Air Commodore Kedar, sir, uh, I think I'll clip 30 seconds off your two minutes because we're running slightly behind uh, time. So very quick question, a short, sharp one. How can academia contribute towards geopolitical risks to the businesses? 
uh, you see as academia we uh, are at all times involved in studying and analyzing what is happening around and at uh, national forensic sciences university we are not restricted to the tactics part or the application part but also in the technology so in that way we have been uh, working towards uh, training the students as well as capacity building by conducting a short term training for the industry leaders for the uh, government officials in terms of uh, homeland security in terms of intelligence in terms of uh, uh, law forensic law in terms of forensic psychology okay so that is our what uh, we are doing our bit as far as the Uh, capacity building of government officials in various uh, areas and the industry is concerned as far as the direct uh, impact is concerned i have a view that uh, we could conduct and apprise the uh, industry leaders as to what is prevailing on the geopolitical side because we are constantly monitoring and analyzing what is happening around so we could think of having a periodical interaction with industry to apprise them from our point of view who, who have got time and energy to do a detailed study as to what is happening and how in a possible way it could impact thank, thank you thank you thank you sir and and samir last question uh, what will workplace of future look like i think one of the most important part is people were saying that uh, do we really need a office the, the opening thing would be that yes the offices are here to stay and we will be back to the offices it's only a question of time workplace of future would be would be very very interesting uh it will obviously have a lot of technology built in uh, <clears throat> there will be there will be lot of renewals reviewing revamp uh, there will be concept of hybrid working which is going to come in there will be new normal etc etc there there is going to be a high focus on wellness and ergonomics for sure within the workplace there will be more collaboration area you will have opportunities to go and work from smaller cities smaller towns Uh, you could open up your offices anywhere i think technology is there to support today so there 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 will be rise of players which are there in the co-working spaces in the managed office spaces there will be work from home so they are going to go higher there will be challenges around infosec but then yeah i am sure technology will help us um, help us mitigate that so new offices would mean an office from anywhere the hybrid working is there to stay the rotational work from home or the work from home is going to stay but then offices definitely they will be the focal point for all of us this will be the new normal thank you so i would have loved to go on and on but before tanya intervenes and we are completely running out of time so we come back to each of you for your quick closing remarks 30 seconds maybe one sound bite uh, same order bruce we go first with you uh bring uh, your collaborate across the organization focus on people risk no matter where they are thank you lloyd yeah there's a phrase going around at the moment that says build back better i would change that and say let's build forward better wow awesome yeah prashant well i have a very uh, short line in the 33% uh, philosophy where i i have 30 33% of my time devoted to my work 33% of my time devoted to uploading and 33% to networking that that completes my 100% wow air commodore sir yes as academia we are with you at all times wow in seeking your help and helping you out in whatever way we can wow with you always okay samir so i think uh, we we are uh, coming out of what we were there in couple of years and for the corporate real estate world this year would be the one where we will be back to pre pandemic levels of perhaps well wow. thank you so ladies and gentlemen we have had a most fascinating discussion so uh, we covered much ground from geopolitical risks uh, world in geopolitical recession to travel risks us china all 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 the risks across the region in terms of geopolitics fake news predictions for 2022 industry academia collaboration the four d's of uh, lord that i picked up dismiss distort distract and dismay uh, so you know don't depend on pseudo experts you know go to the experts uh, bruce the optimistic note pandemic to endemic for the developed world but concerns remain around china and then the unvaccinated world uh, prashant 
uh, security not a support a governance function jack of all trades 33% each uh, uh, lloyd and collaborate uh, and uh, bruce collaborate across organizations lloyd build forward better and an academia with you always so on that reassuring note i would like to thank all the participants uh, bruce mckindo lloyd figgins prashant nayak samir saxena air commodore kedar thakur and to the uh, 320 of you who are still there and and and, and many who logged in and probably 400 of you who heard us and so thank you very much it has been an absolutely fascinating session we had a fascinating keynote and then by caesar and before that Uh, excellent opening remarks a fascinating panel now and look forward to rest of the day with much optimism and enthusiasm so thank you very much tanya back to you thank you so much sir uh, and uh, thank you to all the panelists who have joined us today and shared their views with us it was indeed a very very knowledgeable session with this we will now move forward and without further ado we will now unveil the uh, asia risk review 2022 The APAC Risk Symposium has been put together by the team of analysts at Midcat and subject matter experts at Midcat and to unveil the document I call upon Aparna Gudar she is the associate director at the predictive risk intelligence team at Midcat she has previously worked with the organizations such as ISS security services india electronics and semiconductor associations and the city group her rich and diverse experience has been instrumental in making the pri vertical a brand to reckon with and she will be taking us through the document Uh, Aparna, over to you. All yours. Thanks, Tanya, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's an absolute delight to be in such august company. I will just be sharing my screen. A quick check if my screen is visible and if I'm audible. Tanya. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. It gives us immense pleasure to unveil Midcat's annual publication, the APAC Risk Review 2022. that's the document the report contains in-depth insights into key risks that continue to impact countries across the asia pacific region the report contains several detailed illustrations including risk scenarios of concerns as well as the country wise risk rating distributed across five different parameters including internal security political stability natural disasters infrastructure as well as economic stability infogra infographics such as key risks for each of the countries and corruption perception index have also been included we have also included a very detailed covid-19 update as the world continues to grapple through one of the biggest business business disruptors of our times Thereafter, the report sequentially lists all the countries in the APAC region, ca capturing the key risks and their anticipated impact in 2022. The APAC risk review can be downloaded from our website. Link for the same has been provided in the chat box. We will also be providing short podcasts for risk pertaining to each of the countries, and the same can be viewed on our YouTube channel very soon. We also personally request all of you to follow our LinkedIn page. to stay updated on all the future activities as well as publications links for all our social and media handles will be provided in the chat box stay tuned for a comprehensive demo of the midcat risk tracker portal thank you so much and back to you tanya thanks thank you aparna we will now uh, move forward as aparna said to the demonstration of midcat's ai enabled portal and for this i call upon atria bhat who is a geopolitical analyst uh, with the midcat uh, he has been involved in several topical special reports for midcat and is enthusiastic about sustainable technologies and electric mobility uh, atria can you hear me what do you yes tan all right thank you so much a very good afternoon to everyone present here uh, it is indeed a privilege to be among such esteemed company My name is Atreya Bhatt, and I am an analyst with the Predictive Risk Intelligence team. And uh, I am very excited to show you the uh, artificial intelligence-enabled risk monitoring platform that Midcat has. This is a very efficient and useful tool for GSOCs, command centers, and incident response teams, as well as risk monitoring teams across the world. And I'll quickly show you a demonstration of the portal. Sharing my screen. Right. I hope my screen is visible. 
Yes, it is. I'm sorry, just a second. Right, um, beg your pardon. So uh, the screen that will first be visible once you log in is the one you see uh, right now. Uh, all uh, This is a global map where all asset locations and uh, manufacturing locations and office locations will be geotagged as you can see on the green pins that you see here. The diamonds that you see on your screen are all risk related events that Midcatch team of analysts create over the day. Uh, once you hover over the diamonds, you will be able to see a succinct summary of what the alert is about. And once you click on it, uh, a description of the alert will be visible. Every uh, alert that Midcat creates will have a description, impact analysis, recommendations, and background if applicable. Uh, further, uh, if it is a live event, all live updates that will occur through the day, uh, over the hours of the day, will also be visible. Uh, related events, for example, if the event is something pertaining to COVID-19, uh, similar disruption, similar disruptive events will also be visible. This is downloadable as a PDF for internal circulation and ready access. Further, all affected entities, that is asset locations, uh, manufacturing locations, etc., will uh, also be visible based on an impact radius for greater geographic focus. Uh, to go back to an event that has occurred a few hours ago, you can use a keyword search and you will be able to access that particular event. Uh, you can also filter out the events uh, using uh, you know, filters such as type of events, type of risk, level of risk, and the region. You can go back to about five days, and once you apply, you'll be able to see all risk-related events that you wanted to look at. Uh, the uh, first feature that I'd, I'd like to show you is the RIME. So RIME, is, uh, RIME stands for Risk Intelligence Monitoring Engine. So um, Rhyme is an artificial intelligence assisted, uh, AI assisted platform that has been developed by Midcat internally. Uh, it relies on really simple syndication. And uh, so all the alerts that you see on the screen are populated live and uh, they're, they're pretty much real time. So they're extremely efficient for GSOCs, incident response teams and monitoring teams. And uh, once you click on the alert over here, you will be redirected to the website directly. And a point to note, a very important point to note is that uh, Rhyme will populate 24 seven. So in the event that a team has, for example, missed out on a few events during one duration, you can definitely filter out those events. You can go back to the duration that you know the events may have missed out and download it. You can also apply filters such as risk categories and relevance. This can be downloaded as, a, as, a, as an Excel format. Right. Uh, the first feature that is uh, all accessible towards the right side of the screen is event archives. Every alert that Midcat creates will have a unique tracking ID using which you can directly locate that particular event. Further, if you want to access uh, you know, a list of events that were shared during one particular month of a year, you can fill that in here and download it. Uh, the next one is the upcoming events section. Upcoming events is a list of all risk-related events. They're, they're, it's a dynamic list. It uh, includes all the events that are likely to happen over the coming days and weeks for uh, quick access and to exercise any mitigative measures. The next one is the annual calendar. Um, the annual event calendar is a list of all recurring events that occur uh, or, you know, on an annual basis across several regions. Uh, it includes uh, national holidays, it includes festivals, etc. that might have some kind of an impact on employee operations and client operations. Uh, the next one is uh, the weekly forecast. So the weekly forecast is uh, an amalgamation of, uh, you know, the uh, upcoming events as well as the event calendar. So it includes, it's a, it's a dynamic list, so it includes all the uh, events that are likely to happen over the coming week, and uh, this is helpful to exercise any mitigative or uh, preventive measures for certain risk-related events. The next one is uh, the resources section. 
So the resources section is a repository of all important documents that MidCat publishes on a regular basis. It includes advisories, periodic updates, special reports, risk reviews, et cetera, that are annual, semi-annual. Um, these can be browsed on this part of the section, on, on this section of the portal, and it can also be downloaded as a PDF for internal circulation and ready access. The next is uh, the city briefs section. Uh, city briefs are one page advisories for various regions and cities that have been mapped across Asia, South Asia, uh, APAC and other regions as well. So uh, the city briefs, as, as you can see on the screen, include all uh, important features of a city. So it's important if, for example, an executive is traveling to a new region and would like to know the various risk uh, factors that are posed in that region. So it includes um, terrorism history, civil disturbances, crime rates, important business hubs, key risks, etc., and also includes important recommendation and helpline numbers. Similarly, these also can be downloaded as a PDF for internal circulation. I beg your pardon. Right. Uh, the next is the COVID-19 dashboard. Uh, this uh, is an important part because it tracks all important statistics and regulatory measures uh, that have been implemented. Uh, in view of the third wave of the pandemic, several states have implemented changing guidelines. So uh, to remain in compliance with the dynamic regulatory environment, all uh, implemented measures can be accessed here as well as important statistics such as um, you know, total number of cases, deaths, testing numbers, etc. Uh, these statistics and implemented guidelines have uh, been updated, are updated regularly for metro cities as well as uh, states. The next is uh, the query response mechanism. This is an important part because it sets this portal apart from other uh, portals, etc. So in case there are any queries pertaining to risks that might be posed in the upcoming week or uh, certain regulatory changes for compliance requirements, you can post your query here. And MidCatch team of analysts that uh, monitor on uh, around the clock basis will get back to you at the earliest. Uh, the next one is, just a second. I'm so sorry. Right. So uh, the last feature of the portal is the risk exposure. Uh, the risk exposure directly quantifies the risk that is posed to your organization. So as you can see, uh, this is a quantification of the risk that, is, that has been posed due to events that have been shared by, on, in the recent past. These are mapped based on uh, the various risk alerts that are shared with you, starting from events that are scaled at very low risk, that is scaled at zero to one, ending with events that are scaled at a very high risk that is zero to five. So these events are directly disruptive to your businesses. Um, all uh, asset locations will have their risks quantified as you can see towards the left side of your screen. And all important risks are also mapped on the graph as you see here. Uh, so in the recent past, regulatory risks, health risks, travel risks that are posed by the third wave of the pandemic, for, for example, are mapped on this graph. Lastly, all uh, top risks and the major topics of risks that have been affecting your organization are uh, viewable on the right side of your screen. Um, that brings an end to my portal demonstration. Uh, thank you very much. Please note this is a brief run through of the demonstration and for a more detailed demonstration of the portal, um, the contact details will be provided on your screen uh, as well as uh, in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atira, for the brief and illustrative demonstration of the Annable Portal by MidCat.
with this uh, now we'll move forward uh, with our second panel discussion which is on socio economic environmental and supply chain risks which will be moderated by colonel sushil pradhan colonel sushil pradhan is the executive director and chief operating officer at midcat he is a distinguished military veteran and an accredited trainer with the united nations colonel sushil pradhan has led complex security operational logistic audit and training assignments in europe africa middle east particularly in iraq and myanmar and has been frequent speaker in various industry forums i would like to uh, remind all the participants to please pose the question in the q and a box and uh, over to you sir thank you so much uh, tanya for the kind introduction and i hope you can all see me and hear me well yes sir yeah it's a great privilege for me to, and an honor for me to be uh, moderating a panel with such eminent industry experts and before i start off i'd like to introduce them one by one i do not see one of my panelists joining us yet but i'm sure uh, he would uh, join us very soon uh in no sequence uh, particular sequence i would like to introduce first to you tony luck who is a consumer global supply chain expert for over 3 decades tony is managing director of srs and also the ceo of project argus which is a subsidiary of srs he's been a founding member of the non profit supply chain innovation network which is a global community of speaker of leaders in supply chain innovators He is also a member of the board of advisors with the International Crisis Room 360, which I am sure all of you in the risk profession would definitely have heard of. And he is also the chairman of the TAPA APAC board of directors. TAPA is the Transport Ed Asset Protection Association for those who are not uh, familiar with the terminology. And he has been uh, the chairman of the APAC board for almost 12 years. He has also worked with other uh, agencies like the Lear Corporation, Scheffler Group. Tyco, Astrata, and TNT Express, amongst the others, and uh, he comes with uh, a huge amount of uh, experience in the supply chain business. We also have Sachin. Uh, Sachin Puni is the regional director of APAC for Cardinal Health. He's an astute industry professional with over 21 years of extensive and in-depth experience in the fields of security, loss prevention, facility management, people management, administration. including 6 years overseas which he spent uh, uh, gaining experience in healthcare bfsi retail telecom manufacturing and fmcg sector he is a graduate in business administration from the university of west london uk and he's also got a host of top industry certifications like cfe anti terrorism specialist tapa certified auditor oshas 18001 uh city and gill certified security officer london and a microsoft certified systems engineer as well so you know just echoing what uh, prashant said uh, jack of all trades so here is one person who seems to be not just a jack but a fair amount of mastery in lot of trades uh, welcome sachin welcome tony and uh, also have the honor to introduce another very eminent industry professional that is Uh, Colonel V S Chandrawat, Sena Medal, C P P. So Colonel V S Chandrawat is a former Army Special Forces officer with extensive operational experience in intense counter-terrorist environment in Jammu and Kashmir, northeast parts of India, and Bhutan with the Indian Army Special Forces. For his valor in counter-terrorist operations in Kashmir, he was awarded the Sena Medal and also a Chief of Army Staff Commendation. he commanded the elite 52 special acting group which is also known uh, commonly as the black cat commandos uh, or the national security guard which is the actually the only counter hijack task force of india kanal chandrawat uh, took premature retirement from the army and ever since then has been working in very senior corporate security positions and currently he is the group head for corporate security at the adani bank welcome kanal chandrawat uh i also have on the panel today with me dipayan mohanty who i do not see has joined us let me introduce him so that as and when he joins in we do not uh, interrupt the discussion to introduce him again so dipayan is a founder and managing director of the hemera group which he founded in 2010 he is a supply chain professional again the group moved out of india singapore hong kong philippines germany and Uh, USA, which has a turnover 
in excess of 400 million US dollars. It also specializes in international commodity trading, structuring cross-border supply chain funding solutions, and global risk management advisory services on supply chain. Dipayan happens to be a BTEC from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur in India, and also an MBA from the IIM Bangalore, India. Prior to his entrepreneurial venture, he worked with the Cargill Group for 14 years and also with Tata Steel for five years. So uh, Dipayan in absentia, welcoming you and uh, hope you join us soon. Uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today this panel discussion is going to focus uh, on various aspects of socioeconomic risks, supply chain risks, and uh, risks that are related to environmental issues in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we heard the stage being set very well by Janil Sharma when he said that socioeconomic and climate change risks are going to be critical to the region. We also heard some of the panelists in the first panel who primarily spoke about geopolitics, but also touched upon the aspects of socioeconomic issues and uh, supply chain risks. So uh, in no particular sequence, again, you know, I just wanted uh, the initial three minutes of thoughts from all of the eminent speakers. So we could start with you, Tony, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, from Singapore. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, uh, everybody from Singapore. And uh, uh, it's, um, it's amazing to see uh, how many people have joined. So, um, you know, well done to everybody, the organizers. Uh, and look, uh, hi to, to all my other panelists. And uh, let's, see, let's see if we can deliver some value for, uh, for the people listening in. So look, um, the, the, let's talk about the supply chain very briefly. Um, <laughs> I don't need to remind you about what happened in the pandemic, but what the pandemic showed is that uh, in terms of the supply chain, it wasn't as prepared as, as it should have been. Uh, and those of you who have got some experience or, or if you haven't got any experience of the supply chain, I would always suggest you, you get it because everything you can see uh, has actually been moved by transportation. And of course, like it's, um, it's guys like us that actually, um, you know, make sure it's picked up in one piece and uh, delivered in one. Look, as we saw in, the, um, uh, in China, um, despite, despite the fact that, um, you know, we, we have all of these standards, we have all of these processes internally, we saw a lot of, a lot of Fortune 500 companies actually come unstuck. Um, you know, we, uh, and, and look, when there was actual spikes of recovery, um, we saw the automotive um, industry collapse uh, and, um, you know, they weren't able to produce cars, parts all over the place. And clearly there wasn't a plan in place. And then where, they were, where there was a plan, the plan wasn't convincing enough for the authorities, you know, to allow transportation to actually occur. And this was, a, for instance, you know, going from one area to another area. So that really, you know, started the whole thing. And um, look, every, the whole world came to a, a grinding halt. Now, look, it was, for me, it was a foreseeable risk in the sense that when the world started to reopen again and people would start to order, and of course, you, you know, they were restricted from um, actually going out. So, you know, people were driven to e-commerce. So it, I think it was a foreseeable risk and it should have been uh, addressed earlier. Um, because obviously, suddenly there was this pull ahead in, on buying. People weren't going out spending money in restaurants. So, of course, they were spending online. Uh, uh, and, of course, then that, cr that created this uh, complexity and suddenly this demand in the supply chain. And obviously, the capacity wasn't there, not in terms of aircrafts, but also vessels and, and trains. Um, but look, if you look at some of the recent uh, events uh, in the US, you know, uh, we, we see that uh, the pandemic has had a, a social uh, and economic uh, impact uh, where people are now, you know, breaking into trains. I, I'm not sure if anyone's seen that. Uh, literally, um, you know, these trains have just been broken into every single day. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the rail can't deal with it on, a, on, on their own. Um, the, the police, um, you know, are, is out, technically it's outside of their territory because it's, actually managed by the, the rail network and, of course, the local government who are, you know, dealing with the, the, the local population who are, um, you know, some of which are taking advantage of the situation, you know, also needs to address the issue. So there, there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of pressure on the supply chain at the moment. And, you know, we just don't need all of these calamities. Look, I haven't forgotten about the chips and I'll, I'll talk about the chips later on. Thanks, Tony. And uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting concept or the thought that you said that all of this was foreseeable to some degree, but uh, we really don't know how many actually had the forethought to uh, point out the issues, the gaps and managed to overcome them. But definitely we'll come back to you on this. And uh, I, I wanted to take uh, the views of Kanal Chandravat. You know, he handles such a massive portfolio of security issues, not just across the South Asian or the Asia Pacific region, but also across the investments that the Adani Group has made in infrastructure projects all over the world. So he, he sees a completely global outlook to uh, socio-economic risks to businesses and to supply chains, of course. So Kanal Chandravat, uh, your opening remarks, please. Thank you, Kanal Pradhan. Uh, hello to my co-panelists. Um, so like, uh, you know, socio-economic, we live in abnormal times, like in un unprecedented times. I was talking to a friend of mine in the morning. She had a yoga studio in a place called Rishikesh. And her partner was a very well, you know, educated, learned person and running that yoga studio very successfully. And COVID hit them and they went out of business. The partner has sold the property and he's wandered to Himalayas. He left everything and walked away. Uh, there was a, her, another partner in, uh, in the United States. Uh, he committed suicide, a very, very, very well to do a businessman. So people's lives have changed. And who would have thought in you know, January 2020 that we will you know, live in, the, in an environment or a kind of world which is today. So the people who make masks have become billionaires and the airlines and hoteliers have gone out of business and it has impacted us in such a big, big, massive way. Um, I, and all of us whom we, whom we know personally have been affected with this. So it's, it's like including yourself perhaps. So it's not a normal time. And this effect uh, is also still ongoing. This Omicron has come in now again, you know, kick-started this COVID again. And who really don't know the, who knows the future going forward? And uh, last year was bad enough. So it had slowed down the economy. It had unemployment rising up. It has digital disparities, vaccine shortages, supply chain constraints, uh, you know, medical infrastructure is cracking. So a whole lot of things have, so we thought the worst was behind us in 2021. And now we are in new year and in the second week of, third week of January. And is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I really don't know. So the challenges are going to be, uh, I think, going forward. And just, just not the COVID, the, the geopolitical situation around you, you see what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening with, with the you know, South China Sea, what's happening in the Indo-Pacific with these new, new alliances like, uh, you know, the, of course, and they are coming into play and they are, they are further complicating the whole, whole process. So it's going to affect uh, the business in a significant way. I feel that uh, the, the, the cohesion of society is eroding there are digital inequalities and divide. The cyber you know, security failures are happening at a, at a pace which you can't, can't imagine where the state, sec, you know, state, state actors are involved. Uh, two days ago, somebody said that the Ukraine is likely to face a kind of a, a, kind of a shutdown of its uh, system because of a major cyber attack. And then US-China trade, uh, trade uh, war, which is going on, is also affecting the world in a, in a significant way. The consumer behavior has changed. I mean, I, I, a guy like me thinks, you know, what am I doing here? I must go in the Himalayan, you know, stay in a small cottage where I'm safe and happy. So my requirements are probably, you know, my priorities of my requirements have changed. So therefore, it also affects the business in a in, in significant way. And the way people, people don't want to travel by train. They want to buy their own car and travel in the old car. They feel, they feel safe. They're in the car. So the cars, car prices, at least in India, have, you know, the car prices have gone up and car uh, sales have gone up in India in certain corners, in certain corners. So the attitudes have become minimalistic, only essentials, you know, no, less spending on luxury and non-essential items. And that, that subdues the demand and it affects the business in that sense. Uh, if in 1922, uh, 2022, if um, the supply chain continues to get disrupt, disrupted the way it is right now, a uh, lot of business will come under severe pressure. <clears throat> Uh, they already are under pressure, so their survival will be, become a kind of a kind of an issue. So investors must brace themselves for further localized lockdowns, you know, lockdowns travel restrictions. We already know that, um, um, as, as, as I said, COVID was not bad enough. Now we have five Gs affecting the flights. So you, you know, so the, these are the these are unknown risks which you are seeing on a daily basis. 
Ukraine is on the brink. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with Ukraine and the EU is right now not very united, really speaking. So some may panic and, you know, financial market may tumble. You don't, never know the Sensex today is down as such to 600 points. Yesterday it was 600 points down. Who really knows? So these are the, the kind of uh, you know risks going forward. I foresee, and in, in the in the relations of in, in China and and United States are also a cause of concern for all of us in this particularly in this region. Um, finally, I just want to say the disruptive technologies which are coming up uh, will make uh, a lot of other technologies redundant, and you will see new technologies coming up which will affect our life in a very uh, significant way. And in many, to sum it up the whole thing, I think in next, this year looks like a year of survival you know, to me going forward. Uh, if you can survive this time, um, it, it, the Spanish flu in I think 1917 lasted for a year, a year and a half, two years. But this is, seems to be ongoing. So two years we sustained it. Can we sustain it for next one year is a question I have. And um, so that's all I have to say right now. Uh, subsequently, I can thank take you. questions. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Chandrao. Really interesting views. And, you know, this new aspect which you introduced into the discussion of how social behavior or uh, human behavior is also affecting businesses by the way we look at things that we want to spend on and the things that we don't want to spend on. And, of course, uh, your, your point about year of survival, I think uh, we will also touch that a little later. And uh, I just want to park that point with you because you happen to be currently the only uh, or one of the leading experts in this audience and on the panel on airport security issues. So just wanted to take your views later on this 5G controversy and please educate us because a lot of us seem to be groping in the dark here. Uh, the, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to welcome Dipayan who's been able to join us on the panel. I've already introduced him to you. So, Dipayan, uh, take a deep breath while uh, Sachin, uh, you know, uh, gives his views on the various socio-economic risks that, and, and even environmental risks that are likely to touch upon the Asia-Pacific region in the coming year. Thank you, Sushil. Absolutely. Thank you, Sushil. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to continue from where Tony and, uh, you know, Kannal Chandrawat left. Uh, we can actually say that operating in the international marketplace has become very complex business. Uh, you know, in addition to all the logistical challenges that were brought upon by the pandemic, the trade compliance is increasingly challenging due to the dynamic regulatory environment and the rapidly changing economic conditions that we face in the businesses today. Uh, we can also say that uh, you know, an established import-export compliance program not only protects the company, but it also helps to ensure that all the employees and the relevant stakeholders, they understand those rules and regulations and how to abide by them. Now, specifically talking about the supply chain security aspects, uh, you know, we've got certain major programs like CTPAT, more relevant for U.S., AEO, which is more relevant for uh, Europe, and of course, TAPA, which is the most popular one uh, within Asia Pacific. Now, again, uh, you know, there are a lot of business benefits of getting, uh, you know, our organization compliant and following these standards, uh, the procedures and the processes that are laid down. Uh, you know, so again, being a U.S. organization, working for a U.S. organization, I can, I can lay out the benefits. So effectively, uh, you know, if, if a U.S. company is manufacturing outside of U.S. and wants to bring the goods inside back into U.S., uh, it, it typically takes about 15 to 45 days for a container to clear the customs. However, if you are either CTPAT or AEO or TAPA certified, depending on where the products are coming in, that time can actually be reduced to 24 to 48 hours, which specifically means the containers would go in through green channels. Now that brings a challenge uh, onto the organization to ensure that any container that is going inside mm -hmm. does not have any kind of a contraband or, or human trafficking or weapons being put into those containers and entering US through green channels. To, uh, you know, again, so, so the similar supply chain security, uh, you know, was, was again becoming an issue prior to pandemic as well. However, pandemic itself brought a new set of challenges. Uh, you know, before pandemic, if, if you raised a request hypothetically saying that, okay, I need 50 containers within Thailand to go over to US, 
there were 20 suppliers who would come back. We could uh, you know, take our time to do our due diligence checks on those suppliers to ensure the security aspects and select the best one. Now, if there is a request of 50 containers, probably two or three suppliers come back and they say, oh, we've got five or 10 containers available for you. You take a couple of hours to confirm those requirements and you get a reply that those containers have gone. And the prices have shot almost five to six times. Uh, you know, typically a container would cost us about $5,000. Now we are paying in excess of $25,000. Now again, the biggest challenge that as security people that we are facing is how do we ensure that we still remain compliant with these programs? Uh, you know, one of, one of the recent incidents that I've been working on is a whole container went missing uh, from the Rotterdam port. Now, this container was actually sent from Mexico to Rotterdam. And when we actually started working with the police and the authorities when the container went missing, we found out that this is not something new. It's been actually happening for, the, uh, you know, for over a year. And it's not only Rotterdam, but across the world. Now, now, what's happening is that the containers are sitting at the ports because of labor shortages, they cannot clear soon enough. So what the organized uh, crime gangs are doing is they are actually picking up the whole containers. They're conniving with the authorities and the whole container. So just imagine a whole 40 feet container going missing, uh, you know, with all your products. So, so you know, this whole supply chain uh, security dynamic has completely changed. And it, it's kind of bringing a new set of challenges. Uh, of course, shortages of products, of raw materials across the world is again adding. And uh, you know, again, security teams are being brought to the forefront to ensure that how do we first ensure the compliance to these programs? And secondly, how do we ensure that our products are safe and they reach where they are supposed to reach in a timely manner? So I would say that uh, you know, 2022 is going to be very, very critical when we talk about uh, you know, environmental and supply chain uh, you know, risks. And uh, you know, with that, I'll hand it back to you, Sushi. Thanks, Sachin. Uh, really interesting aspect about the missing containers. And uh, we're just trying to link that up to what Tony said about uh, highlighting the aspects about trains being robbed with Amazon uh, supplies on it. So really interesting perspectives coming up where, uh, well, the world shifted from uh, brick and mortar stores to e-commerce. Now e-commerce is running into new challenges, which probably they had never thought of in terms of delivery of bulk supplies via containers or whether it's a last mile delivery to the customer using trains and other delivery means. We hear about uh, Zomato and Swiggy uh, employees or delivery people being kidnapped or their stuff stolen and stuff like that. So very, very new challenges coming up in the whole uh, supply chain right to the customer. Uh, Dipayan, you have been in the supply chain advisory and uh, handling supply chains for so many decades now. Uh, I'd like to hear your views on how supply chain uh, risks are going to change in the coming times. Thank you, uh, Sushil, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, of course, I started my this webinar with the disruption itself. So, <laughs> so coming, uh, joining a bit late here. So, sorry for that. So, global supply chains are getting more and more complex, <laughs> uh, Sushil, and uh, uh, with uncertainties in the world, as everyone has just talked about. Supply chains, which carried, you know, some identified risk, uh, like shipping shortages, pill phrase, quality, documentary fraud, credit, currency, etc. Okay has got a new multi-dimensional, uh, you know, event risk as, you know, we have all just covered uh, by Chandravat or you know, by uh, Sachin. So global trade wars is one of them, Brexit being the other example. We have, we are seeing like, you know, freaky events which are making the raw material shortages. Give, you know, example being, uh, you see the Congo supplies 58% of cobalt to the lithium battery industries globally. Now the Congo is actually facing the child labor issue there. And that is where, you know, a big supply source is being now clogged up. You look at, you know, higher and ever changing safety and quality standards for raw materials, which is eliminating, you know, many supplies for industries like pharmaceutical industries, right? The climate change, as we know, like tropical storms, you know, droughts, flooding, earthquakes are becoming a frequent reality. 
leads to that then tougher environmental regulations which again leads to you know controlling the carbon emissions globally does affect you know the power generation through coal both in china and india economic uncertainties which are actually you know making lot of suppliers to go bankrupted then you know uh, we 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 getting uh, 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 you know even the recent event of drone that we just saw yesterday that has taken up the oil prices up you know by almost uh, you know 7 to 8 dollar now such events are becoming really very very prominent in our supply chain now pandemic like covid 19 along with this event risk has really made lot of unprecedented supply chain disruptions now what are the disruptions we have seen we are seeing a demand drop we saw that demand drop of airline hotel we seen demand surge you, you remember the infamous toilet paper crisis in us right now the reduced productivity the worker exodus of india you know, from the factory point to the farmland back storage access restrictions you see the raw material shortages i just talked about misuse of force majeure clause in the you know in the contracts because some people are taking advantages of that in the contract law then uh, you have the shifting of global manufacturing base which is happening from china to other countries so in this scenario the supply chain managers are thinking really out of the box to stay you know ahead in the curve so few you know few targeted uh, steps which we have seen has been taken you know for example evaluating the suppliers now based on tco rather than pure price tco standing for total cost ownership then you know you have increasing supply sources and flexible inventory management yeah. creating global common centers for data control and planning the supply chain uh uses of blockchain platforms in the supply chain to avoid fraud and you know have much more connectivity to see the entire supply chain the uses of technology i, I mean strategic tie ups with distribution and logistic companies for last mile delivery we have seen that in india there has been tie up by uber with uh, big basket uh, you know they have been tie up by itc with mygett zomato and swiggy uh, those kind of tie ups are coming in so the whole business world is on a discovery mode for optimal solutions businesses operating the space of logistic and supply chain requires you know greater resiliency and flexibility to react to the volume fluctuations for decades low cost supply and minimal inventory were the key tenants tenants of supply chain however as we move up to the current scenario managing disruptions in the supply chain is the biggest challenge for any uh, you know global ceo today thank you over to you social thanks dipayan so much ground covered in for 3 to 4 minutes and lots of new terminology that we heard lots of new stuff that we heard about how tco force majeure uh, all these have been forced upon supply chains in the last couple of years um, so thanks we'll come back to you to hear more about supply chain management uh, and the risks but uh, you know something which you mentioned which i would like to pick on tony's brains are is related to the automation and digitization tony just wanted from from you in quick uh, one and a half to two minutes if you have uh, on how digitization or collaboration or how blockchain technology is helping to mitigate or going to help mitigate supply chain risks in the coming times no absolutely um, so if you look at some some of the opportunities are, that are out there um digitization isn't as difficult as you think i think the most um, the, most of the problems are are the people and most of the other problems are the resistance to change those are some of the the challenges that you would find um so look what i would be saying to everybody is that if you look at the digitization as as colonel just mentioned um it actually gives you an opportunity to to design out shrinkage so um if you look at phantom shipments uh, phantom trucks things about nature you can actually r- remove that because there there is a a record for everything um now look when you take that into a uh, blockchain uh, scenario uh, here you have an opportunity to literally um uh, uh, map everything throughout the whole supply chain but in a digital format which cannot be uh, changed or to that etc um look i would suggest to everybody that blockchain uh, is sometimes an overkill 
for you know for some of the you know the standard shipping that you want. So what I did, I adopted something very similar to a, to a blockchain, where I um, developed my own unique identifier. So each shipment had its own unique number, uh, and that unique number had to be used by everybody, every stakeholder in the supply chain, uh, and any communication going back and forth had to carry that unique number. So it's it's similar to a uh, creating your own internal blockchain. Now, look, we did that just with APIs and uh, EDI messages and things of that nature. So it doesn't necessarily have to be as complex as people think. Um, you know, uh, I, I think sometimes, um, you know, people think, oh, I, I need an SAP or I need an Oracle. You know, and, and invariably, you don't. Um, if you look at a lot of the MRP systems, they're not actually being used to the level they should be. So... So in terms of the, the visibility, you know, one thing I learned as, a, as an expert in the supply chain is that if I, if I take my, my knowledge, my, my know-how, and then I'm able to digitize that know-how, um, I can actually design zero failure supply chains, which, which I have done, uh, and which I've won awards for, uh, which included the Olympic Ticket Committee. So look at SRS, what we've done We've, um, you know, we started that, as you mentioned, we started off Project Argos and Project Argos has taken that digitization, is taking that industry know-how because there's a lot of platforms out there which are talking about visibility. What they're not doing is solving the know-how. What they're not doing is solving some of the problems that um, the other panelists have mentioned. Um, and, that, you know, that's the future of what we're doing uh, is solving Thank those so problems much. in a digital format. Thanks, Tony. Really good to hear that. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening to you today will definitely go and check out uh, SRS and Project Argus and uh, the approach to digitization and uh, uh, simple digital solutions to overcoming supply chain problems. Thanks. We'll come back to you for your closing quote. Uh, but before that, um, uh, moving on to Kan Chandrawat, sir, uh, there's a very interesting comment in the a chat box which I thought I must resonate uh, since you mentioned uh, that you know the year is going to be the year of survival and I think that takes uh, off on your special forces background where uh, somebody has mentioned that Mushkil Vak Commando Sak so for those who uh, don't understand Hindi uh, it, it means that in difficult times the commando is tough so I'm sure you're not the only guy who's going to be tough a lot of people practicing, uh, practicing supply chain risk management security risk management are also going to be needing to be very tough in the year to come. Uh, but going back to uh, something that you specialize in and we wanted to take your quick views in a minute or minute and a half on what do you foresee as a major risks to socioeconomic and environmental risks, especially to ports and airports in the coming years uh, or the coming year or the coming years? And if you could just give us a 30 second soundbite about what is your impression about this so-called 5G controversy to uh, radio altimeters and how it affects civil aviation. Thanks, sir. Over to you. Thank you. So this is um, civil aviation is always the, you know, kind of a first casualty of any disruption which occurs worldwide. And we are no, we are not immune to it. So, so civil aviation is not geographically, you know, kind of a geographical, it's not closed up. It is... So whatever happens in the United States also affects Air India, for example, or vice versa. So therefore, uh, today what's happening, our flights are you know, reduced to 25%. So airlines are struggling to keep afloat. Uh, big issues. Uh, so suddenly there was a rumor of hope, you know, 100% flights are full. Now again, you're going back to the other day I traveled to Jaipur, you know, six passengers on the flight. So, you know, imagine 40,000 rupees they are going to earn from that flight, they're running empty. So those are kind of major challenges. And if you have this kind of scenario where the airports are empty, flights are empty, how are you going to sustain those people who are working there? Uh, so therefore, people, when they go out of unemployment, then what uh, Tony was telling, people start stealing from the trains and people start stealing. You know, the, the crime rate goes up. I have seen four or five break-ins in this colony where I stay, where it was not imaginable about three years ago. And major break, you know, professional theft cases taking place. So it's happening all around. The, and it's going to go, only go, going to go up. 5G, I think it's uh, the problem of more of regulatory issues. Uh, um, the Europe has done well. They've, they've, they adapted to it. And the 40 countries are now working with this technology in the civil aviation. Uh, FAA has taken a stand. So it is kind of a regulatory issue. Hopefully, they'll come around this and find a solution. 
Uh, will it affect us? Uh, maybe it will affect us temporarily. The DGCA or you know, BCAS will take a call on that and we will we'll sail through this problem as well. So it doesn't seem to be a big problem as it is made out to be, but uh, you'd never know again with technology, it's, uh, there are, we are in a gray zone there. Uh, ports, yes, uh, ports are facing their own challenges. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the, what's happening around Yemen, the, uh, what's happening in the Gulf of Aden, what's happening in South China Sea, uh, the, so the shift, there's a shift hit, taking place in terms of where the containers should be placed, where the dry cargo should come. Uh, the migrant labor, which was working in thousands at the ports, have gone to their homes. So there are labor issues, as as I think somebody mentioned, that you know there's no labor to open the containers. So the delays are happening. The truckers have gone in home. So but the whole, this whole societal churnout happening, and it is affecting people and business. And I more than business, I would say. It's affecting our lives on a daily basis in a way we have never imagined. And uh, I only hope and pray that in this 22 input, this, this COVID goes away and we get back to normal. Thank you, sir. Fascinating insights and especially about this 5G issue. Shraddha Bhandari, I hope you're there in the audience and listening because you raised this very interesting discussion on LinkedIn yesterday and which uh, people are trying to answer. Uh, Thanks, sir. Kang Chandrawat, we'll come back to you. There may be a couple of questions uh, from the audience for you, or uh, definitely we would like to hear your closing quotes. Uh, but moving on to Sachin, uh, Sachin, do you uh, feel that from the supply chain or from the overall business perspective, this issue of violent protests and social unrest, which is taking place in so many countries across the Asia Pacific region, is it likely to manifest into serious business risks or is it manageable? And if so, uh, why? I, I know it's a lot of ground to cover, but I can only give you about a minute and a half for that. Absolutely, Sushil. So, uh, you know, yes, uh, I would say that, you know, all this uh, civil unrest that is happening across the Asia Pacific region. Uh, it is, it is very tricky to say that, uh, you know, whether it's going to have a direct impact on the businesses or not. Uh, I, I would say it would particularly depend from country to country, uh, you know, and, and, and again, where in those countries the specific businesses operate. Uh, you know, let's, let's take example of Thailand. So, so again, Thailand has been going through some political issues. Of course, the red shirt issue has been there for a pretty long time. Uh, you know, however, uh, you know, for us having a large presence in Thailand, we are a little away from those uh, geographies. So it, it, it kind of does not impact us directly. But yes, in terms of, uh, you know, having the routing done, we, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, our, our routes, our containers avoid, uh, you know, those, those areas. We, we take certain diversions. So, so again, from a business perspective, it is, it is key to be on top of these things, uh, to be aware and to have that intelligence as to where these issues are happening and, and how to avoid them. Uh, moving on to Philippines now, Philippines, again, we've seen that uh, you know, the drug issue and, and the gun crime, which is at the local level, is one of the biggest issues. Uh, again, for businesses that are operating out of Philippines, it, it basically depends that how do you ensure the duty of care for not only the travelers, but, but for your employees who are actually based out of Philippines and working in Philippines. So, so again, with, with each and every different country, we will have a different set of uh, situation, a scenario that, that a whole new security program needs to be designed specifically for those circumstances. And, and I would say it has to be dealt on case to case basis. So in a crux, I would say that, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to say that overall it will have some impact or not, but yes, it will definitely, uh, you know, every business will definitely need to consider and, uh, you know, devise the programs accordingly. Thanks, Sachin. I think that's really relevant that we have to go country by country. We have to go case by case and we cannot have blanket SOPs or standardized procedures uh, across the organization. They need to be really customized to each country and its specific risks there. Thanks for bringing that out very clearly. Uh, Dipayan, there's a, actually I had a question for you, but I am going to take on a question from the audience and redirect it to you because so that's something very interesting and we would like to hear your views on that. So somebody has said that the Suez Canal crisis of 2021, uh, was it such a big supply chain issue? Is it a harbinger of uh, 
things that may emerge in a, in a similar trend or was it a false alarm I, i leave it to you to answer okay my uh, personal view about the suez canal issue was uh, it was uh, you know badly planned and i call that as an accident okay i look at that way so i would not call i mean to to some extent it's a false alarm because uh, it is uh, well i mean the, you can't enhance the size of the canal right the breadth of it and the whole planning out there in a particular ship went wrong which actually blocked the whole process of, of the breadth of the canal and uh, i would consider those issues are logistic uh, nightmare of a accidental by nature and uh, and not i don't think that will be the issue beyond that obviously such accidents does happen in a global supply chain and it is going to continue to happen that way uh, it, it is just that uh, you know planning has to be little more better i mean that would be my view i don't think that's the going to be a continual supply chain uh, disruption issue is too minimal compared to what the panel is talking about you know with so many other issues around Yeah. So, so if I yeah. can just quickly Fine. come in. Um, yeah, yeah, Tony. The, I was going to ask you. I was going yeah. to ask you, but uh, you yeah, jumped uh, the gun. So the, all the, your, you know, yeah, because you know, what's interesting yeah. um, on the supply mm-hmm. chain innovation group. You know, we discussed this the other night. Was that a foreseeable risk? And the answer was it was. Uh, and there was a study done, you know, uh, uh, two years ago. But um, look, you know, a lot of the recommendations from that were not implemented. So, yeah, you know, as Colonel said. uh probably a lot you know a lot of uh, aspects there not taken into consideration but it was a foreseeable risk so you do agree with dipayan to some extent that it was an accident which could have been prevented i i do believe uh, one I, i do believe it could have been prevented secondly i i i think i don't think there was a realization by the whole community that there was a problem Uh, so the communication on the ground is kind of so the way it was uh, dealt with was not really efficient because they, i think they should have communicated on a much uh, uh, sooner basis that it wasn't going to be a quick fix um a lot of ships could have easily diverted um you know um uh, early enough that the blockade didn't become as big as it did right thanks yeah i, I guess that makes sense so uh you know there's another question from the audience and i would leave it open to the panel whoever would, would like to take that on this is from dushant uh, jambal sitting in the uae uh he says that you know out of the top 100 cities in the world 43 of them in india are at environmental risks so wh- how do these uh, affect uh, supply chain logistics and what can organizations sort of do to mitigate these issues anyone see i would uh, like to uh, just in india just little divert the attention towards a simple environmental environmental risk coming out of a totally unrelated appears to be unrelated subject on the supply chain for example talk about the subsidies given to the farmers on uh, urea okay now the urea is ammonia uh, urea is nitrogen based uh, you know uh, fertilizer right so the nitrogen is going around spoiling the earth quality and the kind of prices that the farmer gets on urea at 76 dollar compared to let's say price in uh, even pakistan at 200 dollars uh, so is the excess use of urea which is actually spoiling the the earth quality so this is kind of a thing coming out as a environmental risk uh, you know which is end of the day affecting the supply chain again so uh, sometimes which is looks as a very innocuous things like a subsidies going for urea affecting environment which seemingly to be for the farmers these are the pointers which i think we need to sometime oh. give attention to yeah that's re- that's really connecting the dots for us thanks and kal chandravat you are also going to say something on this so uh, quick one minute so see environment is not just a corporate responsibility it's everybody's responsibility you travel across a train from let's say here to bombay and you'll find the entire track is littered with plastic cups of tea now who is responsible is is it the railway responsible or is the people who travel are responsible and then who cleans up if if it all is such a environmental so it's it's not a one day thing and okay, okay there's a one solution and we'll fix this solution let's say for example some mangroves are dying down in let's say goa yeah. 
I mean, it's it's a it's a collective social responsibility which people need to understand. And this is what happens in Glas Glasgow recently. People have realized that look, this this is going to affect us all of us, and it's not uh, just India's problem or China's problem, or United States problem. And hopefully some convergence will take place uh, at a global level or a regional level to fix this problem. Otherwise, uh, we are all sitting, I mean, what, what India does or what, let's say, China does, it affects everybody sitting maybe in Brazil, God knows. So it's a collective responsibility and people must become conscious of it sooner than later. Like I plant about close to about 40 trees a year without fail and I make sure that they are sustained. It's not just planting. And today in this, I've been here for six years. In six years, 167 trees have now become self-sufficient. Now that's my contribution to it. Somebody can do it. You can start small. You can do big things. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's really interesting. And you know, yesterday I was reading about uh, a, a very senior uh, British person who bought an island in the Seychelles because it was uh, being destroyed by pollution. And he turned it around. And uh, now he's. Uh, it, it's so good in terms of diversity that it's been declared as a natural a national uh, Park. So, so that's the kind of individual contributions that people can make. Uh, Sachin, just one quick take from you, one minute take on uh, uh, what is it that we must really watch out for from, uh, let's say, uh, sustainability or environmental compliance issues, because you did touch upon this, which is the one or two things you must really warn companies to be careful about in the coming year. Again, uh, uh, Shashil, so, so we being a more manufacturing-based organization, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of emphasis on the environmental aspects. And, uh, you know, our, our uh, CEO has gone out and made a statement that we will reduce our carbon footprint by 50% in the next 10 years. Now, that's a pretty big and a bold statement that's been made. Uh, now, again, to achieve that, we have started looking at various aspects, things like uh, use of EVs, uh, electronic vehicles for employee transportation, not only in India, but across the globe. However, the challenge that we face is that, uh, you know, even organizations, when they make similar kind of statements and they try to move into, uh, you know, this direction, we don't have the basic infrastructure in place to support uh, organizations. Uh, you know, so, so again, from an environmental aspect, it's like uh, you know, not only organizations, as, as Colonel Chandrawat said, it is everyone's responsibility. I know we have always said that security is everyone's responsibility, but again, similarly, environmental issues are everyone's responsibility. Now, organizations, uh, you know, there are a lot of regulations that kind of force them to comply to uh, environmental, uh, you know, standards, how they deal with uh, things like wastewater, uh, pollution, etc. But effectively for us as individuals, uh, you know, what is it that we are contributing? Uh, you know, of course, there are no standards or regulations on individuals, but, but the biggest thing in the next decade is that how we as individuals contribute to the cause and how do we ensure that uh, you know not only the organizations uh, but us as individuals also make sure and contribute towards uh, you know the sustainability and betterment of the environment thanks sachin very interesting and you know we have a very nice comment on the chat box by daman dev sood who says that he's coordinated the planting and nurturing of 4,000 trees, which is uh, amazing. So, so hats off to you. Uh, well, folks, we are almost at the end of the time that we had available for this panel discussion. So I'll just do a quick round robin to everyone for their closing remarks, which should not exceed uh, 30, or your closing quote rather, rather than a closing remark. So we'll start with you, Tony. Thank you. So look, uh, uh, I would suggest to everybody, look, reach out for help, um, you know, digitize your processes. It doesn't have to just be supply chain, it could be any process. Uh, look, understand your operations. It's no good trying to digitize if you don't understand your operations. So develop your team and, and, uh, and make sure you develop yourself. Um, you know, don't, um, don't be a, a, a technology phobe, okay? It's, it's not as difficult as people would like to, to make out. And look, create real-time visibility uh, and, you know, look for those red flags and obviously measure your carbon footprint. Thanks. So thanks, Tony. And that's really important for a lot of us. Don't be technology phobes. Technology is not as difficult as we think it is. 
And if you don't know it, reach out to the experts. So I am sure there would be people definitely reaching out to you uh, to understand more about what you have to offer. Uh, Dipayan, any last quote from you on the subject of uh, risks in the APAC region, especially to, south, uh, to supply chains? Sure. Um, in addition to technology, I think it's very important for every corporate member, global corporate member, to keep a watch on the environment. I think, you know, the environment is extremely essential compared to what the importance it is getting today. Uh, you know, climate change issues, the environment and the uh, you know, such issues I raised like child labor and uh, those kind of things can really disrupt the supply chain and your business in a big way. So just my closing remark will be to keep a watch on the environment, which is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Dipan. That's really relevant in today's uh, sustainability uh, environment. Uh, Kan Chandravat, uh, your closing quote for the session. Oh, I am generally an optimistic guy, so I always believe that if winter has come, the spring is not far behind. So you should, right. there will be some, someday this whole thing will end and, you know, good days will be back and we'll all go back to our holidays and everything else. But I would request that in any capacity we can cooperate, collaborate, share knowledge, be a little more compassionate to the people who don't have the resources uh, like you and I are fortunate enough, you know, don't know how to wear a tie for that matter. Take care of those people in your own way and just be just be about uh, helpful to the society. Do your bit a bit and it will help some people. And just let, let this stuff time pass and everything will be fine. And I, I hope so. Thank you. That's really a great takeaway about collaboration and helping out people who don't have the resources that uh, you and I may be more fortunate to be blessed with. Sachin, your closing quote on the subject before Tanya cuts us off. Absolutely. So I'll be really brief. Uh, you know, I would leave us with a thought that, uh, you know, the convergence of physical and cyber security has already started, uh, you know, and, and we as security professionals, as physical security professionals, how are we preparing ourselves to move into those directions? Uh, specifically when every organization, or, or let's say there's, there's a real traction where the organizations have started moving towards a, a whole enterprise risk management approach rather than looking at silos as, as we've been working in past. And, and with that, I'll, I'll repeat something that Prashant said earlier, that, that it's always better to be jack of trades rather than being master of one. Thank you. So that, that was a great session. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists. I do not want to make any closing remarks because if I start summarizing the wealth of uh, inputs that I've gathered over the last 45 minutes, I I'll take another 45 minutes. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, guy is, uh, thank you so much for the fantastic uh, commentaries and responses. Uh, I have one more request for all my panelists. Please stay on. And there are a lot of questions in the Q&A box. So I would request you all to uh, address them to the best of your abilities by typing out the answers there so that the audience feels that, you know, even if we couldn't give them enough time in this uh, panel discussion, their queries would definitely be answered and would be available for others to read as well. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Please, uh, audience and everyone, please give me, uh, please give a big round of applause to our panelists for having brought out their reviews so crisply and so candidly. Thank you, Tony, Dipayan, Kanchandravat, Sachin, and uh, we hope to see you in similar events uh, again to come. Thank you so much and over thank to you. Thank you once again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you to all the panelists for joining us today and sharing their views. It was a very enlightening uh, session and a great one. So with this, we come to our second keynote address by Dr. Parag Agarwal. Uh, on safe water as the next geopolitical and socioeconomic fault line. An entrepreneur for over 30 years, Dr. Prag Agawal is the founder and CEO of Janajal, a unique tech-enabled water services company. Since 2013, Janajal has successfully demonstrated how a social enterprise can leverage technology at multiple levels and make safe uh, water available and accessible to people in an affordable and equitable manner. He is widely recognized as uh, one of the e Asia's leading social entrepreneurs and has been an advocate of sustainable social entrepreneurship. Janajal uh, WOW Water on Wheels, the IoT managed clean fuel powered three wheeler, has been selected by the Government of India and the Ministry of Jal Shakti as one of the five technologies to deliver the Har Ghar Jal, save water to every home, and deliver a $50 billion water scheme under the National Jal Jeevan Mission. 
This is the first time in the world that such a technology has been adopted by any state-sponsored water program that hinges on decentralized water distribution. A votary of safe water for all and deeply committed to the use of technology to make a difference, Dr. Parag Agarwal was awarded honorary doctorate for contribution and impact by the National American University, USA. Thank you for joining us, sir. We are honored to have you. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, uh, it's such a pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, you know, first of all, I hope my teleprompter is going to behave itself today. <laughs> So, but, uh, you know, I've been tuned in since this morning and it's been an absolutely riveting uh, first half of the day. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to all the speakers for, for enlightening us with, with all the wisdom and experience uh, that uh, they possess. Uh, uh, let me quickly jump into it. Uh, I've been asked to speak on water being the next geopolitical and socioeconomic fault line. I wish there was a way to do justice to the subject in as little time that I have been given but I will do my best to present water and its paucity as the biggest geopolitical, socioeconomic, and human life threat that needs to be mitigated before any other. I sincerely believe that every word spoken to amplify the situation will only add up, just as I believe that every drop of water saved shows up in someone else's glass. It is ironical that the largest problem faced by the world stands completely taken for granted and disregarded when it comes to addressing the problem. Yeah. Nobody seems to be willing to take the responsibility to adopt a holistic approach towards solving water issues. Just like security cannot be beefed up by adding a couple of guards at the gate alone, installing a couple of water treatment plants is absolutely not the solution to making safe water available to people in a sustainable manner. For the longest, we've been advocating the need for a multi-pronged, multi-skilled, and multilateral approach towards solving water. And to do so, the first step is understanding the difference between water and safe water. Of all the water available in the world, approximately 4% are fresh water sources. Within those, the bulk of them are contaminated. We all know how in Southeast Asia, and most specifically countries like Philippines and Indonesia, despite being surrounded by water, they have nearly 100% of the people buying their daily dose of potable water. It is also pertinent to mention here that the, the challenges faced by these two countries are entirely different from the challenges that a country like India would face. India is a landlocked country, while both Indonesia and Philippines are what I call decentralized countries, as they comprise of thousands of islands. Piped water is a pipe dream for these countries. So what is the solution? What should be the approach adopted by public and private organizations so, they, so that they can implement a solution that is viable, feasible, sustainable, and profitable? We often discuss the cliche, the next world war will be fought for water. How many of us realize that these so-called most awaited wars are already upon us? I'd like to illustrate this point with three prominent ongoing active situations in the APAC region. Recently, there was news that Taiwan and India have been working to ink a mega deal to set up a semiconductor chip manufacturing plant estimated at $7.5 billion in India. This would supply everything from 5G devices to electric cars. The surge in the sales for electronic devices during the pandemic has created a huge demand for the semiconductors. But COVID-19 is not the only factor behind the shortage. The tense relationship between the United States and China is also a factor, since many US companies do business with Chinese companies. For instance, Huawei, which, is, uh, which supplied to American chip makers, has been blacklisted by the US government. This proposed deal is being hailed as a global rescue, and several WhatsApp groups have, you know, I saw them erupting in national pride that once again, India is going to save the world. Sounds great, right? Now here's the bad news. How many of us know that water is fundamental to the manufacturing of semiconductors? Over a series of steps, semiconductors are built in layers on silicon wafers into integrated circuits that are also called microchips. To create one integrated circuit on a 30 centimeter wafer, it can consume approximately 2,200 gallons 
of water. That is a whopping 8,300 liters of the purest form of water for a 30 centimeter wafer. To further provide the, a perspective, this amount of portable water can cater to one Asian household for an entire year. Can India afford this? The second point I want to make is how many of us know that the India-Pakistan conflict in Kashmir is not for land? It is for control of four rivers, the Chenab, Indus, Jhelum, and Ravi that flow through the valley and are the lifelines for Pakistan. Recently, China has been in conflict with India on the northeastern border. Geographically, India maintains an advantage, uh, uh, China maintains an advantageous position and can build infrastructure to intentionally prevent water from flowing downstream into India. The Yarlung Sangpo River flows through Tibet and eventually becomes the Brahmaputra River when it enters India. China has already approved a super dam in Tibet last year and have a, a total of 28 proposed dams in the basin. The intent is clear to threaten India's water security. No marks for guessing why they also happen to be close allies and friends to our neighbors. So it is safe to say, I'd like to believe that water is life. Of the 17 SDG goals drawn up by the UN, SDG six stands for clean water, while water directly or indirectly affects another nine. No tech disruption can ever substitute the need for human beings to consume safe water to survive. Tech can only augment uh, its quality, availability, and accessibility. The only way I believe is to harness existing water resources and water treatment infrastructure using technology to integrate, aggregate, and optimize their management and operations. Janajal was founded precisely with this objective in 2013. Over, over, over eight years, what started as a water ATM company has eventually grown into a proprietary IoT enabled tech platform that enables remote supervision, operations, maintenance, and management of existing water treatment plants globally. I know the emphasis here is on the word existing. The company evangelized a whole new category of unpackaged branded water by creating and dispensing safe water in bulk, thereby eliminating the use and intervention of single use plastic containers from the environment, as well as human bodies that ingest microparticles of plastic from the water they consume from branded bottled water. We also delve deep into why the water sector was largely loss making and unviable. That, led to that search led to understanding that the water consumption was predominantly driven, not just by the need for increased accessibility, but the greed for it. Don't we all want our water sitting on our desk or by our bedside or served to us by someone else if that were possible? This led to the development of a unique IoT controlled clean fuel powered three-wheeler called the Janjal Wow, Wow being water on wheels that delivers water to the doorstep of households. Um, I, Tanya you know, touched upon this, but the, the WOW is now selected by the government of India as one of five technologies to deliver the Har Ghar Jal mission, which basically means water to every home and is poised, and is poised to play a significant role, not only in, in the future of India's water security, but also in various countries, such as Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Access to financing, has been one of the greatest challenges of the water sector. For the last one year, Janajal has been working in the capacity of a knowledge and IT partner to H2O DAO, the world's first water impact token. Decentralized water treatment and decentralized water distribution will now be supported by a digital platform built on blockchain that will offer decentralized governance, decentralized ownership, and extend decentralized finance to the water sector. Besides, it will offer an interoperability layer that will allow sharing of knowledge, best practices, operating standards, and last but never the least, uh, data. The goal is simple, to build the world's largest water sharing economy in an equitable and transparent manner. For the first time in the world of crypto, a digital token is being launched in the form of a DAO a decentralized autonomous organization that will directly be tied to safe water. Whoever owns the token 
will have the right to redeem the token for safe water in different geographies around the world. As the price fluctuates, so will the redemption value of the token. At every stage, the holder of the token will have a right to receive or deliver water, safe water, in any region of their choice, whether for captive or for philanthropic initiatives. It's the only way to own water. I would like to conclude by saying that as far as the water sector is concerned, there is no competition. There is only collaboration. After all, there is no planet B, and it is upon each one of us, individually and collectively, to work towards saving it. I thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words and also for taking out time and uh, joining us today. We will now move on to our third panel discussion, uh, which is on the topic technological risk outlook and which will be moderated by uh, Pavan Desai. A former submariner with the Indian Navy, Pavan Desai has 25 plus years of experience in the security risk management domain. He has been involved with initial setup and growth of a Mahindra Group Consulting Company in the domain of cybersecurity before co-founding Midcat Advisory Services. Currently, he is the CEO and has led several high-profile complex and multi-dimensional risk consultancy assignments with industry leaders across uh, various verticals for more than 100 plus blue chip companies. Uh, thank you, sir. Over to you. Very much, Tanya. I am uh, audible. I will request my panelists to switch on the videos. Thanks, Burgess. I can see Burgess. I can see Rex, uh, Sanjeev, Jaspreet. I guess I will give uh, 10 seconds to all. Yeah, I am waiting for Sanjeev. Uh, to, yeah, he is there. Uh, I can see him. Yeah. For Only some reason, I can't switch on my video. I'm going to check your mic. There's some issue in the echoing in the mic. I'm not sure. Is it, yeah. better now? Yeah, is it better no, now? No, it's no, it's not. There's a lot of static. You can maybe your headphones. Yeah, is it? Uh, is it better now? Uh, no. Stop the video. No, it's your uh, headphones no. are crackling. Your headphones are crackling. Yeah, yeah. Remove yeah. yeah. you your headphones. I'm not using headphones. So. Maybe you want to use them because it's completely crackling. Sorry for that. Uh, it tried is. all the links, they were all working fine. Uh, it happens. <laughs> technology ultimately is there. Technology uh, for you. <laughs> yes, technology for us. Uh, it, it, it comes back to. Uh, sorry, is it? It is uh, just changing. Uh, it is still bad? It is pretty bad. Yes, it is pretty bad. Uh, uh, Sam, may I request you to just uh, take over uh, this thing? I'll just. Uh, this thing. Um, I, I tried that. We did the contingency planning in the morning only. This was happening. We tried all the possible changes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So let me, I think I can straight away. So am I visible and audible? Loud and clear. Yeah. Loud and clear. Finally, good, good. And good to meet friends. I think Sanjeev, good to yeah. see you. Warm welcome on a winter morning from London. So thank you. Thank you, Burgess. Uh, so we, we have our PC in place. So, so no worries on that. Uh, Vishal, my good friend. Thank you. Uh, it'll be good to get your perspectives on. Uh, it'll be good to get your perspectives on supply chain and government initiatives. Jaspreet, thank you very much for joining us, and and my friend Rex Lam, thank you for joining us from Hong Kong. Wow, thank you. So good. So I think we can. So the way we go, probably I think we can start with Burgess and uh, and, and a very very brief introduction. Uh, so Burgess Cooper, uh, you know he is he is a I, I would say a very prominent thought leader in the space work, working with a big four and and in India, anybody who's in cybersecurity knows Burgess very well. Uh, Jaspreet uh, is India leader at Grant Thornton and uh, Vishal is, uh, has been uh, the uh, national, he has been the, I would say, he has led the world's largest skill development program. Let me simplify it for everyone. So about, uh, 10 million people he was killing at one and how he used to use technology. So it'll be good to hear. We have Sanjeev joining us from London. It will be <coughs> get a more broad perspective. And, and Rex, it will be good to get your perspective right from Hong Kong, the, the heart of Asia. So, so, so what's happening and how organizations are managing. So Burgess, why don't, instead of, you know, I boring you with my monologue, why, why don't we go uh, to you and, and get us off to a flying start? That would be my request. Sorry, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, sorry. And looking, we will not speak good too. Looking good too, Pawan. All right, thank oh, you okay. so much, Samrendra and Pawan.
Uh, I just start to start the conference, uh, Vista's new challenges 2022. While all my fellow panelists will talk about tech, IoT, 5G, SCADA, blockchain, I'd like to get a human angle to this. I think the biggest challenge in 2022 would be two things at a human angle. A, learning to lead a remote workforce because we all have been traditionally, and we've adapted quite well in the last pandemic, but continuing to you know, completely lead a remote workforce, working from anywhere, any location, anyhow, uh, meeting clients virtually, meeting your teams virtually, getting them to stay bonded in the, in the, in the era of the you know, biggest, migra- biggest attrition. How do you maintain that? So A, I think the two biggest challenges are learning to lead a remote workforce. And second, developing a technology acumen. You don't have to be an IT CI or professional, but you got to uh, start thinking technology. Okay, the way tech is changing, it's practically impossible for us to stay. So these are two starts. Back to you, uh, Pawan and Samrendra. I think these two are the biggest starts to my first uh, opening comments. Technology acumen and learn uh, to lead a remote workforce in 2022. Great, great. I think Burgess, uh, excellent uh, start point. Uh, thanks a lot for that. And you uh, always uh, comes with uh, uh, with something new, always uh, not conventional any time. You have never been that. Uh, uh, now I'll move on to Sanjeev. I think uh, he, he sits in the hub where, where the technology incubation and uh, you work on the cutting edge technology where it happens. Uh, you will come to know much before uh, anybody else comes to know what is happening in technology. Your views and your opening comments on what are the trends and what do you see will be the fault lines uh, 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 of, 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 from technology perspective on that? Thank you, guys. And I'm not too sure if London is the hub, I think. I would love to know that. I mean, that would yeah. be great. I mean, thank you. I, I, uh, I you know, say, what do you do? Or what do you do more from not the location? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I understand now. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for the kind introduction. Really appreciate it. You know, this is this is technology. I can have a conversation while I'm just doing my regular thing, right? It's just, yeah. and this, is, this is unbelievable. 25 years ago, if we had a pandemic, we would be in a very messy situation, right? We'll be in a pretty bad situation. Now, thanks to technology, uh, I think uh, we are, I mean, I'm in my 40s, so I understand uh, a life with facts, life with, uh, you know, what was that thing, pager. Uh, and now, I mean, loading files, I mean, uh, when we were send emails, it used to take a long time. If you were, if you were, uploading a 25 MB file, it used to take a long time. So the technological journey that we have all taken over 25 years has been unbelievable. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of these companies that exist today, they are all technology companies that are powering valuation. So old school economy uh, and the tech, tech economy is completely uh, you know, different in terms of what they managed to deliver in terms of growth, uh, wealth creation, employment, transforming the global society is unbelievable. Now, in terms of in terms of the trend, uh, look, the trend sometimes the good thing or the they, so the technology is a double edged sword when you're looking at investment perspective when you're looking at deploying capital. Uh, technology goes through a phase where you, I mean, if you remember, we all remember, I hope, uh, we had so many internet bra- web browsers before, right? I mean, we had so many web browsers. Uh, a lot of them died off. Uh, so the t- technology goes to that phase where a lot of what we are seeing as a trend may or may not exist after five, 10 years, because it will go through that churn and uh, the markets will take over, entrepreneurial spirit will kick in, the markets will adjust, the consumers will adjust to it. And then again, society will play a role uh, and there will be technology that will have lasting capability, they will last, uh, and technologies, they will not last. And I'm referring more to the trends here. You are looking at more trend on blockchain, you're looking at more uh, cryptocurrencies, et cetera. Uh, So, you know, so we can, I mean, 
obviously, when we have further discussion on it, we will deep dive into it. Uh, but digitalization is is happening. It's it's transforming the society. Technology has become an enabler. Uh, it's kind of you know uh, kind of in terms of le uh, leveling up the playing field. You're seeing that already. I mean, uh, you can access to anything and everything you want from anywhere on uh, anywhere on the planet now. Uh, you can uh, reach out. You can access people. You can access. Uh, ideas from, from anywhere on the planet, or you could go and put your idea on the table from anywhere on the planet. So that's where the business is, is going. That's where the society is going. Now, as an entrepreneur, our job is to make sure we just pick the right technology. We just pick the right sector and we put our allocation in that sector. So, so that's where my opening, I think, uh, commentary will be. And then happy to deep dive into whatever the discussion will be. Great. I think thanks a lot uh, for, for amazing uh, the opening remarks. Uh, uh, let me move on to uh, to Vishal. I think you have seen uh, you have seen it all from various angles, uh, right? From being uh, 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 in, in uniform, uh, the saying and and seeing uh, uh, from government perspective, that is one one of the machineries which uh, which moves very very slowly. But when it moves, uh, there is a huge impact. So we'd like to listen from your side of the story. That how how do you see the whole uh, technology? Uh, if you say the the underlying technology, how the entire movement is ha happening, especially if you talk about the e-commerce uh, um, domain or, or that, that kind of a domain. Uh, uh, maybe your opening remarks on that, please. Yeah, thank you, Pawan. Uh, yeah. uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'll probably you know uh, take off from my manner to say that you know 3 billion people in the world do not have access to internet and any technology, right? So there are there is a social inequality, digital inequality, and uh, and to bridge that, uh, the government of India had actually launched a program uh, to think on a very large scale with respect to skill development. So, uh, uh, and you would understand that India is a test bed for any kind of scale related things which you want to do. And uh, launching, you must have also heard that Indian government makes a lot of plans, but uh, when it comes to execution, you know, it, it, it suffers a lot of lacuna and obstacles and therefore it falls flat. Uh, uh, therefore, we, when the Prime Minister had announced the Skill India mission in 2016, so I had joined the National Skill Development Corporation because as you said, I had both the public sector and private sector experiences. So we, we embarked upon this journey. The, the scale was so huge and so humongous, then just hearing of, of, of it would actually give you uh, some sort of... Uh, an understanding, you know, imagine scaling 10 million people across 27 states and nine union territories, 40 sectors spanning the whole economy of the nation, 115 aspirational districts identified by Niti Ayo, 22 of JNK, 95 of Northeast, 106 left wing extremist areas, 35 worst affected extremist areas. So, you know, and you have to do that uh, on scale across the country, uh, uh, and that couldn't have been done without use of technology right so and when we embarked upon this journey we found that we were very uh, we were very scant in terms of technology so we had we had to scale up the whole stuff you know right from the things like you know accreditation of training centers across the country then uh, the erp based skill development management system ensuring that all unscrupulous unscru unscrupulous elements who a route to misappropriate government funds are taken care of through a proper monitoring and evaluation through technology related applications and so on and so forth. So a huge lot of uh, a technology you know, push and, and uh, use of technology through Aadhaar, you know, Aadhaar enabled biometric attendance systems, uh, QR coded certifications, uh, integration with the government's public fund management system. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, and to ensure that uh, the misappropriation of uh, the government funds doesn't happen, and you are able to get the data and uh, from the Center of Monitoring, Center for Monitoring of Indian Economy and RBI, to be able to identify investment pockets in the country and be able to ensure that you do skill development in those pockets so that you know people are in the local areas are able to you know get jobs and all that stuff. So uh, in my opening remarks, Pavan, I would just like to say that uh, the last decade has seen us. Uh, a quick adoption to technology, and we have realized it through execution of e-governance and government programs. 
and with this covid 19 i think the whole thing has got accelerated to such a pace that the only risk ahead is that we should not get disrupted and you know fall somewhere because of the pace we are trying to you know uh, reckon with yeah that's it Absolutely. from me as a thing yeah it's a mammoth uh, scale and i think it is is going to grow only as as the days progress i think uh, great insights uh, on, on the entire uh, initiative by government of india uh, that that um, uh, uh, i'll move to the next point from that so with the adoption of new technologies so many devices getting connected so many iot devices getting connected i'll i'll move to jaspreet on on this thing uh, that uh, uh, with the advent of so many iot devices getting added to the network uh, every every minute i'll say not not even days kind of thing and 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 uh, looking at that we are bound to fail it's not that we are not as an organizations as corporates as government everybody as a state uh, some point of time we are going to fail so what what is your view uh, as an um, uh, opening comment on the adoption of iot uh, and uh, the resiliency behind that because that is going to the key uh, the maybe uh, uh, survival uh, thing for us uh, to move ahead in this right uh- thanks pavan uh, i'll allude to uh, points made by all the three fellow panelists you know burgess started by saying people uh, mm-hmm. sanjeev spoke about technology and vishal spoke about skills if i add all these three together this is exactly what is not required in an iot world iot world is something which is all is connected there are no people it's it's all technology talking to each other one of my favorite videos on youtube is Uh, how the world will function in 2025 it it starts with a person sleeping right it's about 7 o'clock in the morning his mm-hmm. alarm uh, goes out at 7 o'clock immediately the alarm clock gets a notification uh, from his email system which says that his first meeting has been post- postponed by half an hour which in turn informs his car saying that i am not leaving at 8 o'clock i leave at 8:30 which in turn informs the gas station from where he would have to refuel right now imagine all of this is interconnected and and it's not uh, 2030 but it's it's actually happening as we speak because of the iit because of covid the digital disruption if i add people if i add process if i bring the entire technology piece we are looking at digital disruption 18 months ago right according uh, to a world economic forum top risks report uh, that a chance that a pandemic would hit and affect more than 30 countries was just 9% similar report in 2018 saying that the number of interconnected devices or iot devices in the world will reach about a billion devices by 2020 and in 2022 we are talking about 7 billion devices right so so the number has just been blown out of proportion so but it also creates new opportunities for this information to be compromised like it rightly said right uh, because this this more and more sensitive data being shared it's it's not just about data around uh, my usage it's it's data that can affect healthcare system it's data that can affect energy systems we all saw what what happened to ukraine right uh, about a couple of days ago and and uh, there are four or five fundamental things that i would want to talk in my opening statement that is missing right uh wherein people are still not talking about an integrated risk philosophy they still talk about it and iot risk very very separately we have tons and tons of standards floating around for it risk tons and tons of experts talking about it risk mm-hmm. how many of those standards or experts could stand up and talk about iot risk where are those industrial control or industrial control engineers who actually have worked on those tada systems ics dss who will actually go down and design those controls and and budget spoke about you know the entire human aspect right uh, i would i would uh, veto that and and say that that's again a big big problem from an entire iot security space and and then uh, you know uh, how do i retrot my entire work i can retrot i can connect it and ot but does it introduce new risks and finally uh, you know the entire loosely coupled systems that are being connected today is is a huge huge risk back to you pavan 
Okay, thanks. Uh, excellent point. I think it's more about the integration. So I think a, a great point which you said, it is more going to be about integration. So uh, let me get in Rex Lamb, which is a, uh, the person which uh, you were mentioning. It's a, it's a person in physical security domain with a computer science background. So it's, these are the people whom we need uh, more and more as we, as we go ahead. Maybe Rex, uh, your opening remarks on the, the whole advocacy, uh, which, which is how we are seeing uh, uh, around, which is happening around the convergence, getting all security professionals together, whether be the cybersecurity, physical security, resiliency, fraud risk management, mm -hmm. uh, everything. So right from phishing to social engineering to uh, 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 IoT risks, what is your what is your view and how do you see the world or Asia Pacific in particular in various maturity amongst various countries? What is your view on that? Um, when we talk about security um, at the moment, we have different silos within the corporate. And one of the initiatives that uh, AASIS, uh, which is uh, the organization that I'm the chairman in Hong Kong, that, that we represent, it's the, that we advocate the holistic approach towards uh, security management, it, regardless of security disciplines. And the reason it's important, it's because from the threat source point of view, they, they have no silos. They, they have every expertise that they could gather and with one single mind and they're very focused and they attack the assets and they get the job done. Am I breaking out? No, we can no, hear we you. Can, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, okay. we can hear Because I, I, I saw uh, Pawan kind of paused for a minute. I, I thought I was breaking out. Oh, anyway, so, um, so okay. from a criminal go ahead, go ahead. point yeah. of view, um, they have no silos. And from a Security management, that, 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 that's my background. Um, from a security management point of view, um, there shouldn't be any silos in, inside the organization. And the, the enterprise um, overall approach, it's a relatively new idea. And um, the standard that ASIS came out was back in 2019. Um, the work started in 2017, but the work came out in 2019. And so um, I'm seeing this trend, um, it's slow, but gradual. It's, there's one um, security, um, you can call it head or director or, or, or chief of security that manages all the security disciplines regardless of types. And, and the view, it's kind of accelerated by the pandemic. Um, for the past two years, um, I think the pandemic affected almost everyone on earth. And it made a mark on uh, many people, especially from an asset protection's point of view. Um, but with every crisis, there's danger and we, can, we should not let that crisis go into waste. And what I see is the opportunity that we have now is we, we are starting to realize the virtue of simplicity. Um, technology by itself, um, it should enable us to do what we want, but Sometimes what we see is um, technology companies, sometimes they are profit driven. So they have the marketing buzzwords, if, if you will, to try to um, push into the market. And that sometimes, sometimes, only sometimes, conflicted with prudent risk management. Because too much features, it's not a good thing. Because when you have too much features, then you have more doors open and you try to you know, manage everything and, and the security department, like it or not, it's always understaffed. <laughs> and so, um, so the opportunity here is that we starting to realize the virtue of simplicity and the general awareness of the endpoint soft target users, the awareness of security, it's a little bit higher now. Um, I, I can see that because even my mom, when he when she receives the email, she will say, "Huh, this email looks you know kind of fishy." Um, <laughs> so that's when I can tell, you know, um, when, when when a mom figure like that can spot out and phishing emails, I, I can see the whole industry or or, or the whole human uh, 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 humanity as, as a whole. It's it's taking up taking this opportunity from this crisis, and so I'm I'm opt I'm optimistic um, uh, about the future. Uh, from a security management standpoint. Um, so um, I, I think um, the, the, the trend would be convergence 
and um, raising general awareness. Um, so we are coming from the top and we are coming from the bottom and we are closing the security gap. Great, I think excellent. I, I really like that. So I'll check with my mom whether she can identify the, that will be the benchmark for us. <laughs> Uh, whether these programs are effective or not. Great. I think uh, I, I, what you talk about is virtual simplicity and, and uh, doing greater good to humanity. As entrepreneurs, we always feel, I think it's all about opportunities. And I'm very excited with whatever I've been listening to uh, since morning, I think it's almost three uh, three hours plus. Uh, uh, there have been fantastic insights. There, yes, there are various risks, but yes, uh, with that, lots of opportunities. I was reading a book by uh, Paul Polman, uh, uh, the CEO, uh, former CEO of uh, the, the Unilever uh, uh, he says there are three things uh, which is which are going to be crucial to create an uh, uh, maybe a business model uh, for the future. The three things will be the that divide the, the 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 divide which is there currently. The divide is huge between you know, the word used is inequality. Uh, second is how do we manage uh, the uh, entire cybersecurity of it? Uh, the entire thing. I was very surprised when he used the word cybersecurity as one of the key pillars uh, in in terms of shaping the new uh, business model. And then third, with uh, it is going to be the sustainability uh, which is there. Uh, so with that, I would like to come back to Burgess and uh, Burgess. You have been talking to, uh, I think, cybersecurity professional, I think every day you uh, talk about that, but this is going to be a slightly different audience, uh, uh, which is there. And how do you see it differently? Uh, how, if you have to create a different business model, uh, and if cybersecurity is going to be one of the pillars of creating the new world, uh, if you say, what are the key, maybe learnings you would like to share and you would like to share with, uh, with all of us uh, in, in creating a new business model for the future on that? So great point. I think you know yeah. a different problem requires a different way to see it. Up till now, our generation, which has started with cybersecurity as a firewall admins, IT admins, servers admin, always were programmed to see cybersecurity as a cost center, the detriment. If something happens, you spend the danda approach. You know, saying if you don't do this, even the stick approach. Always a more negative, more sort of do this or else it will happen. If we as professionals start advocating a very different way of seeing it as a cybersecurity and privacy as a potential business brand differentiator, as a business not enabler but a distinguisher, that's a new vista of seeing. Once you have that approach, just like you said, investment marketing, right? Good marketing will get you good more business. So similarly, good security will get you good more business, more customers, more privacy, more everything. Else. If you start seeing it that lens, the way you approach a problem is very different from a cost center approach. Everything else will follow that. The first way is how do you categorize and see the problem? That I think is a big difference. Back to you. Very, very well said, I think. Uh, great. Uh, uh, but just, uh, I, that, that brings me to another point. Uh, I will like, go back to Sanjeev on, on the on the thing. As, as he's uh, doing his morning walks, I'll, I'll again, uh, uh, again disrupt that uh, for him. Uh, uh, in the morning, we had a great session by Caesar Sain Gupta. I think it, he, he talks about the, the speed is, of change is going to be so phenomenal. Uh, and, and we are going to see. And every disruption is going to be in opportunities and in which the business models are going, essentially going to change drastically. And the speed at which they are changing is going to be very, very disruptive and very, very fast. We are used to seeing a change of business models, maybe once in a decade, once in a couple of decades. But now with the new speed of change, it is going to be even faster. Uh, what are your views on that? And how do we keep up to the pace? And how do we even uh, keep on relearning and learning again back uh, as, as, a, as a maybe a non-technology guys on that? No, that's a, that's a, that's a great uh, narrative to kind of build a conversation on. You know, so my learning, I think most of our learning comes from nature. And nature and the universe went digital billions of years ago. I mean, it went digital billions of years ago. And virus plays a very important role uh, in evolution. I, you know, I mean, if not for virus, human beings won't be possible. That's what, uh, that's what it is. Now, uh, look, uh, in nature, what happens is change is change takes time. Uh, in the digital world, in the technology world, uh, what's happening is transformation is happening overnight in some cases. Uh, and sometimes what happens is as a business, uh, we are not prepared. As a society, we are not prepared. 
So skill has to be completely different. Unlearning, learning, relearning is the nature of the beast now. You just can't rely on the skill that you learn and you can't have that stagnation because if you are stagnant, you become irrelevant. So a couple of things that I think is very important because you're talking about cybersecurity. You have to learn to live in a world where you know you will have breaches. I don't care if you are NASA, if you are CIA or NSA, you will have breaches. A 19 year old sitting in London or in India or in Hong Kong will breach. You have a 19 year old taking control of Tesla cars and Tesla cannot do anything about it. You just have to go to that 19 year old and congratulate, reward, and say, you know what, work with me. That's the way it is, it is going to be. Uh, you know, so we're talking about IoT of things and all of that, machine communicating with machine. There are a lot of problems around it, right? There is a lot of problems. We think we are prepared. I remember in, tw in early 2020, I was in Davos, and we were talking about this pandemic, and people were telling me, oh, this is nothing. This is a Chinese thing. It will never come to our shores. What are you talking about? It's not. And they were all expert, by the way. They were all expert in the area. We were talking to scientists. We were talking to people. We were talking to CEO of banks, global banks. And I don't want to reveal their name, but they told me, you know what? This is just silly discussion. Let's not discuss this. There is no, this is not, we are blowing it out of proportion. That was Davos. Apparently, everybody in Davos is supposed to be a world leader in what they do. So obviously, we don't know what is happening around the corner. And we are so globalized. We are so globalized that we have absolutely no mirror to see what will be the impact of an event happening in China or event happening in India tomorrow or event happening somewhere else on the planet. So... The thing that we need to understand is we need to learn to live with things. We need to understand as a society, as a business, as a, as a, so, you know, th this is, this is important. I think it's very important to uh, uh, identify this. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, you know, if you had cracks in your policies, if you had cracks in your governance, if you had cracks in your management style, uh, it would take time for it to become visible. Today, the cracks are visible just like that. So people are able to see those cracks because information is so easily available to people. And you're not used to fixing problem on the go. You need to take a step back. You need to hire your team. And, and, and the markets are expecting you to fix things. This, if you're in governance, the society is asking you to fix things. You're a political leader, that is. And that's where a lot of confusion is happening, right? because the cracks are becoming more and more visible. You're able to find that spot. Uh, you're able to uh, put, a, uh, put a light on that crack. And this is where we have a problem of, uh, you know, technology doing things that we are not there to understand yet. Uh, so you will have a businesses that will utilize technology. I mean, you have Facebook now trying to transform itself into metaverse business because they understand maybe this is the next thing for them. Uh, you will have Apple becoming, um, getting more and more into their medical device. So smartwatch will run more and more of your life. We are focusing a lot more of our effort in health tech because we know health is very, very important for people. Uh, in our business, we know uh, cybersecurity, you just can't have a bulletproof cybersecurity. It just doesn't work. We have spent a lot of money. We have hired a lot of people. Uh, and then you realize, you know what? You know, just have a backup plan. Work on assumption. You will get hacked. You will get hacked. And then you have to figure out whether they will demand ransom. You will have data compromised. You know, so what do you do with your GDPR? You need to have all of these mechanisms put in place. If you have 10,000 customer in one of your companies, and your data gets breached, you need to have protocols in place where you can reach those customers. And you can tell them, look, I have been breached. And this is what our internal discussion is also. We are not talking about how can you bulletproof your system because bulletproofing is not possible. So I think that's my, I think that's my assessment of what, what, I, think what I see going forward. Sanjeev, I think uh, that brings me to the point. I'll, I'll uh, break the pattern and I'll get uh, just breathing uh, back in. Uh, so with the pandemic happening, nobody used to bother about uh, pandemic plans as a part of their business resiliency. And suddenly we started, and you must have also started getting requests to make, create pandemic plans as a resiliency plans. But next war will be very, very different. 
so some of the our clients were asking for if the asteroid hits the planet what is going to happen can we create plans for that i'm i'm not joking i'm serious about that uh, uh, how do you run that? so so uh, so there has been a sort of a paranoia which has now come in and resiliency that you need to have plans for everything around us so uh, just please you you deal with this day in day out how where do where where does the reality lies in where, how much we have to do as as creating uh, ultimately every resiliency has a cost to it and uh, we have to uh, ultimately we have to do business we don't have to uh, create a resiliency that is not the business business is to do business where, where do you uh, draw a line and where what will your advice be to to the to the corporates and the, to management on that uh, thanks pavan uh, very very yeah. interesting question and you know uh, just going back one and a half years uh, exactly two years uh, back in time uh, january 2020 we were presenting uh, to a global board of financial services major and he said i want to plan uh, for a 60 day outage in delhi and 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 we were joking and we said you know uh, 60 day outage uh, is not possible uh, you you won't have a you won't have such a scenario where people will not come to office for 60 days and exactly after 60 days in march uh, we had our first major lockdown right and and I, there are so many people on this uh, esteemed panel and uh, listening to us i would uh, like to ask them one simple question how many of them actually opened their resilience plans uh, either in march uh, during the first wave or april 2021 during the second wave answer is none right uh, and and that's what i think what sanjeev and burgess uh, alluded to we will get attacked we will have problems but the root of any resilience plan is to look at your business understand four things the business is dependent upon people process technology and site anything any event that happens whether it's a fire whether it's pandemic god forbid whether it's an asteroid that comes and hits earth will affect one of these four enablers your business resilience plan has to look at your crown jewels within the organization and has to look at all these four and create a matrix saying if site is not available how do i react if people technology are not available how do i react and i think uh, there was uh, there were uh, there was a discussion in the previous panel around the entire awareness piece and that entire resilience plan has to be made aware to each and every employee of the organization irrespective of the fact whether he is a ceo or to the last level of employee uh, within the organization uh from the practicality of it uh, is again you know we were working uh, with a one of the world's largest satellite majors of this firm and he said i want to create a resilience plan for my satellite and i said you know the cost of putting another satellite out there in the orbit is 3 billion dollars whereas your total business is about 1 billion dollars so if something happens to your satellite it's better that you recover in a month then rather than creating the entire fail over for a satellite so it, it's about also doing a cost benefit analysis and and the last piece that i want to add is a uh, lot of times people make resilience plans only for traditional threats right high time now that the resilience piece moves from business continuity to actually business resilience which also okay. includes like new age threats around technology disruptions uh, around cyber security all of that including your traditional threats to the business Very well said. Uh, yeah, I Thank think you. So business continuity to business resilience is the key, and and be realistic rather than uh, uh, going uh, whole hog and uh, uh, going uh, all nine yards. Uh, uh, that brings me uh, to another point. I'll uh, get Vishal back in. Uh, so you were talking about the speed of change uh, is going to be so disruptive, and things are business models. Things are going to change so fast. But looking from a government side of it, which takes so much of time, it's an elephant which takes time to move. And once it's ha- it has moved, you tell him to move. again uh, it is it is a, it is a, it is a very uh, difficult proposition how do you see in the new era where the disruption is going to be very very fast uh, a mega scale organizations like governments uh, or or institutions or similar to that are going to uh, handle that uh, uh, effectively on that that's a good question so that's a good yes. question so uh, government has realized that Uh, to execute such such kind of uh, big programs, uh, the government doesn't have the capacity and the wherewithal to do it, right? And and and, and therefore now they are uh, more focused on building public-private partnerships. So uh, uh, in PPPs, they ensure that they are able to 
uh, give the guidance in terms of the broad policy guidelines and there is a agency which executes it and that agency is uh, like the one where i worked earlier called national skill development corporation where you have people from the private sector and people who are like techno savvy you can hire people but people from you know i had uh, program management unit from gt from ey from boston consulting group from kpmg so all all this therefore you are able to hire and uh, a quick kind of uh, you are able to build capabilities quickly and you are able to start executing it uh, 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 to be able to uh, what do you call get over that you know uh, get over that uh, uh, issue which you talked about with the two governments so that is one big piece and you would have also seen recently that there is this uh, lot of organization like there is an organization in the space research which is being you know launched uh, and there are a lot of various such organizations are getting launched where the government has understood and they're also having lateral entries of people from the private sector getting into the government and also making these kind of ppps which are more agile which are more which can hire people at will and be able to execute great point thank thanks a lot for that uh, uh, very quickly uh, coming back to rex uh, how do you see uh, the collaboration i'll i'll extend that uh, question to you again in terms of collaboration how do you see the present uh, i say I, i'll not talk about collaboration within the organization but i am talking more about the private uh, public partnerships and across the border collaborations because uh, to have a very effective cyber security in place we need to have a very very strong mm -hmm. investigative piece also uh, to be very very uh, to cyber crime how do we handle that part of it very very strong how do you see that maturity uh, currently and what do you uh, very quickly think we need to do uh, uh, for that uh, uh, across the borders i'll say more of a risk which are emanating across the borders of um i i think it's the public and private partnership it's not at its optimal state at the moment and the reason is because um usually uh, i i i work with private sectors like like most of the times so um when there's a cyber security incident um there's always a target asset that they are trying to get at and when something is breached uh whether you know the the the, the triad you know the cia anything is breached um and they need to initiate a internal procedure to contain the damage to find out what damage was done and they need law enforcement to apprehend the criminals and law enforcement really depends on how much evidence it's left because without evidence they really can't do anything um and so i think the in, in hong kong in particular um and there is a cybersecurity uh division within the crime uh commercial crime bureau and so they put out many information out there but when when the crime actually happens um how do you secure the crime scene even though it it is a digital world how do you secure the crime scene um and it managers um they have all the skills that you ever need in order to um collect the evidence or or preserve the evidence but it it's not a technical skills that they lack that is preventing this this collaboration to happen it's um they they may or may not have a risk management or security sense to um engage um the correct person uh well for for example you need to talk to your security department you need to report the thing to your ceo um and when the thing hits everybody got a tunnel vision and they are trying to fix the problem and they forget about you know i need to preserve this i need to preserve that you know i need to do digital forensic on this one on that one um and so whenever uh, a crisis hits it doesn't matter if it's cyber security or physical security or 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 personal security travel security um it's all comes down to have you exercised this before if you have exercised this before then when something hits then uh you are able to oh you know what i i can't just you know try to fix this uh ransomware incident by myself i need to call these all call this list of people and tell them what's going on before i do all, uh, before i work on anything else um so from that point of view um it's it it it's not at where i i i i would like them to be in general and one of the reasons is um it department or security department they're just so busy at everyday work and it's hard for them to justify uh, more resources however i was having coffee with a bank um with a security manager in the bank she told me 
the security department grew from a seven people team to a 40 people team in the span of two years. And I was shocked. I was, that, that is unheard of in my, I, I don't know how many years in the industry, that's unheard of, like two years, really? Did you say it wrong? Um, but no, no, she, she, she said, yeah, it's from seven to 40. And it, it comes down to um, some security department, they, if, they, if they were to thrive in the business environment, they need to speak the business language. And um, oftentimes when, when, when you can't uh, compete for the enterprise resources, it's because you, you, you don't speak the language that they understand. And so I, I think my friend did the right thing and they can present ways in a way that, that is finance people or senior management people would understand. Sure. That's how they right. achieve that astronomical growth, in my opinion, from 7 to 40. And right. now they are now in a position to achieve what I was talking about, you know, holistics approach, uh, uh, doing drills, everything. And it was only two years. Um, I, I think the effect, it's yet to be seen, but you won't know who is without pants until, you know, the, the high goes out. So, <laughs> sure. um, so, so, so that, that, that's my view. It's, it, it's important for the security Good. people to speak Excellent. the business language. Sure. Like to I add think out to you, uh, Pawan, yes. while yes. collaboration is at different levels formally, I think collaboration between CISOs through WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups, through the recent Log4J incidents, uh, scanners, any, time, any CISO is in a problem, I think there's almost an overwhelming response to help him or her. One <laughs> ask, and I've seen that flurry, what was not happening, sharing maybe four years back. Today, there is, you know, everyone is proactively sharing, oh, I have this scanner, I have this, yeah. you know, the report. So that has really improved in the last maybe two, three years. Well, and that absolutely. really helps. Yeah, that's uh, and uh, that I feel it will be the way forward. Collaboration will be the way forward. I think uh, I'm getting uh, input from the uh, informal, yes, informal, informal way of informal. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm getting uh, inputs for summing up the thing. So I'll I'll stick to a uh, just thirty second your bite on that. How do you see the way forward? What will be your advices to the corporates? Uh, how do you sp uh, see the technology trend and uh, what are the major risks in that? So clear the tech trends will be disruptive. Uh, you'll have more and more tech. But as I mentioned, the human angle to, to all the tech, whether it's an IoT world or any other connectedness, the human angle to making it happen is far more important. Uh, problems of technology can be solved. The human mindset, the tech mindset, the proactive security as a brand differentiator mindset will be the future. Great. Thanks a lot. Sanjeev, your 30 seconds. Yes, you know, everything exists because of people. There will be no economy, no nation state, nothing if there are no people. And uh, there'll be no market and there'll be no usage of technology. Uh, so for me, what happens is there is sometimes a lot of the technology gets hyped, a lot of money gets wasted on those technology and then they, they, they disappear. So I am not a trend follower. I never follow a trend. Uh, and, you know, to, to, to just add a bit, there will always be known unknowns. You can never have all the resilience plan you want. And sometimes it just makes no sense to put them. So I think just be pragmatic uh, and also know that there will always be something you will not know. So be prepared. And, and when you get into a place where you're making mistakes, learn to quickly adapt and learn to be agile because that's the mantra. That's the mantra for survival. If you don't adapt, if you don't relearn, and if you're not willing to go and keep learning, then you might throw, might get into serious trouble. Excellent. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, Vishal, your closing uh, comments, please. I, I would just say that we should focus on the social, uh, the digital inequality part of it and ensure that we are able to do the digital, we are able to, uh, we are able to bridge the digital divide which is existing to be able to take everybody along because uh, if, um, money, money talks, people who have money, they're able to access, they're able to afford, but we need to ensure that we take care of that part of the society also. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, just breathe. I think two closing comments. One, uh, balance between innovation and uh, controls, right? Don't stop innovation just because controls are not there and, and vice versa. And, and second, uh, you know, uh, more focus on uh, people awareness and this work from home hybrid setup is, is here to stay. So more emphasis on technology controls uh, is the need of the hour. And Great. focus on response. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rex, your closing comments, 30 seconds. Um, 
my closing comment, um, I, 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 I would advise everyone, um, if you're a business owner or if you're just a regular users, um, let technology help you instead of hindering you. And in order to do that, um, do not overcomplicate technology and, and simplicity, it's the key. Um, I, I've, I've seen uh, uh, areas where um, people deploy solutions and even experts, I, I have a computer engineering background. It, it took me hours to, to try to understand the thing. And, and it technology shouldn't be like that. Um, it should be easy to use, ready to use. It helps people and keep it simple. Uh, have a one page configuration screen, uh, no more. Um, that way uh, you have a foundation to have good security management in the cybersecurity space. Great. Well, thanks a lot. I think we are, uh, 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 we have off shooted time by a few minutes, but I think great insight. I'm sure I think uh, the, we, we saved the best for the last. Uh, and I would really like to thank all the panelists, our dear friend Burgess, Jaspreet, uh, Vishal, Rilarex, uh, 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 and Sanjeev uh, from, uh, who, uh, for early morning thing. Uh, thanks a lot. I think uh, we still have 200 plus strong people listening to us. So I think the last panel would have done something really, really great. So I would uh, uh, really thanks once again to everyone. And back to you, Tanya. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Pawan, for having us here. Thank you very much. Thanks. thanks a lot. Thank Bye -bye. you, Pawan. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, sir. And thank you to all the panelists for, uh, for your enlightening views. And with this, we are now come to our uh, summary and closing remarks session by Mitesh Shah. Uh, just a second. Yes, I think it's visible now. So Mitesh uh, Shah is a subject matter expert in the field of organizational resilience, business continuity, management, and crisis management. He has over 12 years of experience in consulting and training organizations on how they can de-risk their business and improve their resilience posture. He has worked extens uh, extensively in the APAC region and assisted clients across sectors of BFSI, retail, telecom, and global conglomerates. Mitesh has spoken at multiple business continuity conferences in the region, including Asia Risk and Resilience Conference, World Continuity Congress, BCI Australasia Summit, and Core Business and IT Resilience Summit. In terms of certifications, uh, Mitesh is CBCI certified. He is also a CICA and CICA from ISACA and a certified ISO 27001 lead auditor. Over to you, Mitesh, all yours. Hope I'm audible. Yes, uh, yes, 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 you're audible yeah. and visible. Thank you, great. Uh, it has been a fascinating session, uh, a great learning session, a power packed panel, you know, three panels that we had, and a watertight session, I would say, because we are, you know, we are sticking to our timelines as well. Uh, just to give an overview, uh, we had the honor of having almost uh, 18 panelists from close to you know, eight different geographies. We had over 450 participants joining us from different geographies, more than 16 geographies. And we had the support of our partners, NFSU, uh, Jindal, we had the support of GACS, as well as our partners, SRS and Blackburn. Uh, I have been given a very, very tough task of what was already you know, three hours of power pack panel to summarize in five minutes. So I'll try to do my best. I had written almost 10 pages of you know, uh, learnings today. So we'll start with, uh, our panel started with, uh, our, our session started with Lieutenant General, uh, Lieutenant General Sharma uh, giving us an overview about the geopolitical state today, in not only in Asia Pacific, but overall globally what is happening. He still highlighted, you know, we should have cautious optimism in the air and 2022 would be a year of you no know, rebound and we should see a lot of things returning to pre-COVID levels. Uh, however, he, he has advised us to be, you know, caught, put caution on the geopolitical risks that still linger around as well as the technological risks that are surrounding us. Then we had a very fascinating session by Caesar Sain Gupta. I think I, I love the session because it was pure bliss, 15 minutes of pure bliss. Now what, what he highlighted purely was you know, we will have to adopt ourselves as technology evolves and goes around. Uh, I loved the quote where he said, you know, we need to understand that Asia is the center of gravity of humanity. We have close to you know, uh, 3 billion people, 3, 3.5 three billion plus uh, people here, which are combined more than the rest of the world. So this is going to be a center of gravity and we'll see a lot of technology disruption happening from here. Then we had our first uh, uh, you know, panel session, which was more on geopolitical, where we had Bruce McIndo focusing on people and advising us that people still remain the greatest risk as we evolve uh, in the risk management process. Uh, he also advised that there would be geopolitical 
concerns because as we go forward, there, are, there is Team India versus Team China that is going to have to happen and countries would require to take sides, which is going to be a tough task in itself. Uh, we had Lloyd Figgins, which uh, you know, had a lot of uh, talk around travel risk management. And he said that he highlighted the role of media, uh, which has been a bit more you know, disruptive than much more you know, concerning with regards to the pandemic. And he advised us to you know, build forward together and better. Uh, I like his four Ds, dismiss, uh, distort, uh, distract, and dismay, which was very good insight that we had. Then we had uh, Prashant Nayak from Walt Disney giving us advice on uh, the different geopolitical risk around the region, right from Afghanistan to uh, Taiwan, Korean uh, you know, uh, Peninsula as well. Uh, I liked his two quotes. One was uh, definitely around the 33% uh, you no know, work, 30% learning, and 33% on networking. And uh, jack of all trades, but mean is better than you no know, master of one. You know, in in, in a way. Uh, then we had uh, Air Commander Keda Thakkar uh, talking us about uh, the role of you no know, universities that are played in terms of uh, how, because finally we will require an increased manpower in this session and uh, in, in the industry and where are they going to come from and how you know uh, private sector can collaborate with the universities to uh, give them more inputs and also learn from the new students. Uh, we also sp spoke about the geopolitical context you know, across the region, not just in US, China, Indo, China, Indo, Pak, a different flavor he gave us. He advised us to be cautious about the biases and social well-being considering you know, elections that are coming up in India. Then we had uh, Samir Saxena, uh, which talked about more from the facility background. Uh, he had a lot of optimism uh, in his entire talk where demand is generally going upwards, not just in corporate real estate, but also in retail. Uh, he, had, he was very much optimistic about the hospitality industry seeing an upward trend, as well as the logistics industry seeing an upward trend uh, going forward. Then we had our second panel, uh, again, uh, which was moderated by Colonel Sushil Pradhan, we, we had different views there as well. We had Tony Luke uh, talking about, you know, uh, again, on the technology aspect in the supply chain mode that you, know, you cannot plan for you know, every disruption in supply chain, but you need to adopt technology going forward because uh, adopt, without technology, adopting technology, it is going to be more disruptive environment. Uh, however, he cautioned us that you know, when we adopt technology, we need to understand how it fits with your current processes and it is important to know that as well. We had uh, Colonel V.S. Chandrava talking about, uh, again, showing a lot of optimism, uh, very, very optimistic about that the good days are going to be coming again. Uh, however, you know, he, he did mention that this year, 2022, would be a year of survival for a lot of things, a lot of you know, industries, if you know, the cycle of uh, uh, pandemic continues. Then we had uh, Sachin Puni uh, showcasing about uh, dynamic trade environment. Uh, which was again talk, talking about the, the the overall trade environment being very dynamic, giving very live examples of you no know, no container uh, uh, stolen containers in some part of the world. Again, he was advising more of uh, having country by country you no know, risk management view. We cannot have the same template applied to everywhere. So again, a very very uh, you know important point brought here. Then we had Mr. Dipayan Mohanty talking about you know again supply chain risk. Uh, he was again talking about fluctuating demand surges and drops, which is not good for the industry overall. However, uh, we also highlighted you know how this last two years have brought about some areas which was like you know misuse of force major, uh, how the flexible inventory management got you know got adopted in many industries. Uh, overall, he was uh, optimistic and he but he did caution us about the environmental and climate change, which which I still believes uh, is a big risk. Then we had Janajal. Janajal is the uh, uh, by Dr. Parag Agarwal. Uh, by Dr. I think this is a topic very close to my heart. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, water being a key resource for every industry and how this will be a problem area uh, coming forward. I personally have read an article uh, by my mentor uh, called Nathaniel Forbes about 10 years back and he still believes that you know, we'll have a big disruption coming forward in, in the next decade or probably in this decade itself, which would be surrounding around water. I mean, South Africa as an example last year, if somebody has followed that. Uh, then we had the last technology panel moderated by uh, Pavan. Uh, we had different views. I loved uh, but this is uh, you know, uh, first thought itself that it has to be human angle and it has to be, you know, uh, we have to focus on the human angle because uh, leading a diverse and remote workforce as well as a technology, uh, uh, you know, with, with, with technology being adopted at a caution, it would be good. 
uh, I loved again the quote of that, you know, how cybersecurity can, can be a business distinguisher. We have always heard the word business enabler. I'll keep this in mind, business uh, distinguisher. And uh, good cybersecurity is good for business. And that, that is a good way because it's not always good to threaten our stakeholders that do this. Uh, otherwise, something bad is going to happen. Then we have Mr. Vishal Sharma uh, talking uh, very much highly about how technology can be pushed forward through the adoption of skill development. And I think that is going to be key because uh, human resources are going to be required coming forward in every industry, uh, let it be corporate security, cyber security, as well as you know, business continuity or organization resilience. Then we had Mr. Jaspreet Singh uh, talking highly about you know, how uh, IoT world is bringing a new set of challenges. And with the uh, adoption of IoT, more and more people are getting uh, I mean, more and more industries are you know, going to get more and more you know, cyber risk going forward. Uh, I also like the word that you know, um, uh, moving from business continuity to business resilience. I think that that is a change we are seeing already that is going to happen. Uh, then we had Mr. Sanjeev Kumar talking highly about to be flexible. I think I will put the word flexible. You cannot be stagnant. You have to adopt as uh, with the speed of technology and um, uh, how, how technology changes. Also, Learn to live with the known unknowns. Learn to live with breaches is something that we highly recommend because you cannot. You know, you, there is no. Uh, it is not a road that goes from path A to path B. There will be you know, road bumps on the way. Then we had Rex uh, finally uh, talking about the holistic approach towards the security and how it can be better managed. Uh, I love the way he said, "Don't uh, overcomplicate. Simplify because that is how we move forward. Uh, because not everybody has the you know, uh, right mindset." I'll also do my check with my mom uh, way whether she can you know find out a phishing email because we talk a lot about that in the corporate world. Why not practice at home? Uh, on that note, uh, I'll have two quotes to end it. Um, first by Winston Churchill. Um, Winston Churchill says that success consists of uh, going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Yes, and I think in the last two years, that is what has happened, right? So we had a first wave, we thought everything is over. Then we had a boost of vaccination in the APAC region and we thought, no, I, I am based out of Singapore. We are almost almost 90% there in India. We have administered 150 crores you know, uh, vaccines. And so we are looking at, but still we are having a second wave, third wave. So what is success? Finally, at, at a human race level, the success only can become when we do not lose enthusiasm and focus that this is going to get over one or the other day or we are going to live in an endemic environment by the end of the year. And finally, you know, uh, I'll end my, my session and thank everybody by saying that uh, we can never see a rainbow if we look down. If we want to look up and we want to be optimistic about our future, we always have to look forward and upward. So on that note, I truly wish each and every one a very uh, you know, happy, safe, uh, personally and professionally uh, 2022. And we wish that in the next year when we have a March 2022, we do not have to talk about COVID. We will talk about some other risk other than COVID. So on that note, uh, we I revert back to Tanya and I thank everybody uh, for their gracious presence today. Thank you so much, Mitesh, for summarizing the event so nicely. And with this, we have come to an end of the event. Thank you once again for being here, especially those of you who are here till the very end. I'm sure you will agree with me that we have had lots to take back after today's event. Thanks to the distinguished keynote speaker, panelists and moderators. I would like to remind you that a soft copy of ARR 2022 will be shared with all the participants and a certificate of participation will also be shared with the, all of you who have joined. Recording of this event will be on Midcat's YouTube channel and a brief summary report highlighting uh, the major takeaways will also be uploaded on our website and the LinkedIn page. If you would like to know more about the Midcat's PRI services, uh, please get in touch with us. You may also avail a trial of our services. Last but definitely not the least, a huge thank you once again to our partners, National Forensic Sciences University, Global Association for Corporate Services, Jindal School of International Affairs, OP Jindal Global University, Security and Risk Solutions Private Limited, and Black Pearl. Thank you very much for joining us today.